I'll call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, December 20, 2016. I invite all of you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Daniel Longest, Sarah Gray, and Bella Martin of Delaney? Delaney. Delaney High School. After, uh, after the pledge, I invite you to remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, express the board's appreciation and recognize the students of the chorus from Delaney High School for their performance this evening in advance of our meeting. Uh, Ms. Christina Sanita is the choir director, and we thank uh, you, Ms. Sanita, as well as uh, Onani Banda, Winfield Classing, Annalise Collins, Mia Colborn, Jake Giannino, Mary Charlotte Gitlin, Sarah Gray, Daniel Longest, Bella Martin, Nick Prunkel, Grace Schneider, Emma Shannon, Liam Slowey, and Carmen Zhang. Uh, thanks again. You all were spectacular, and you really um, made tonight's uh, beginning of our meeting really wonderful. So thanks, Delaney High School. And although you are welcome to stay, you're also permitted to leave. <laughs> I'd also like to take this uh, brief moment to uh, recognize and welcome back last year's student board member, Deeksha Walia. Deeksha, thanks for being here. And we're, and we're glad, Deeksha, that uh, the University of Maryland is, is uh, fitting you so well and you've enjoyed and succeeded in your first semester. The first item on our agenda is, uh, is to vote on the agenda. Um, Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions to this evening's agenda. So is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Assembly. Is there a second? Any, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda as prepared stands. Uh, next on our agenda um, is the selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at regularly scheduled board meetings. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening's um, meeting have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers uh, during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if there are fewer than 10 sign-up cards, uh, all who have signed up will be permitted to speak. Mr. Virch. I feel like Mr. Fortune uh, with the count and the amount <laughs> yeah. of the golden cash box. $300, six from the top. Can I read them? Yes. Shu Zia. Pat Hundley. Diana Bergman. Marion Moore. Dr. Bosch. Sanjay Sharma. Bing Cow. Steve Weber. How many is that? Eight. <laughs> Thank you. Lily Rowe. And Nina Sir. All right. Okay. Our next uh, item on the agenda is public comment. This is uh, one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. 
Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. Uh, the board will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by him and his staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, it is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone uh, that inappropriate personal remarks or behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Uh, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time. Uh, I now call first our advisory group um, uh, representatives, and there's only one tonight, and it's TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, uh, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson. There you go. Well, that's not Dr. Dance. <laughs> Ms. White and members of the board. We appreciate having several additional teachers on the Grading and Reporting Steering Committee. We had a very productive meeting and hope to see more collaboration surrounding the initiative. Having teachers and principals allows for the experts to not only voice their opinions, but to move this process in the best direction possible for our students. The annual TABCO ESPBC Legislative Breakfast will be held on Saturday, January 7th, 2017 at the Radisson North Hotel from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It is one, the one event where you are able to talk directly with teachers and support staff as well as many of our legislators. We usually have at least 200 folks in the room. We certainly look forward to your attendance. I know that you'll be attending, Ed. We also encourage you to work with TAPCO and ESPBC on the many legislative issues that will be in evidence during the upcoming Maryland General, General Assembly. Obviously money is going to be tight and we need to make sure our voices are heard as we all advocate for Baltimore County Public Schools. TABCO is also working to involve the community along with the school system on forming and working toward the best outcomes revolving around the new Every Student Succeed Acts or Act or ESSA. I have passed out our flyer about our important town hall meeting, you should all have one, on January 12th at 7 p.m. at the Lock Raven High School Auditorium. Again, we urge your attendance at this meeting. We are working together with BCPS and the community to make sure our students have the best outcomes possible. Finally, as we approach this much needed winter break and holiday season, I hope everyone makes time to spend with their families and friends to enjoy life and relax. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing family and friends and taking some time off from my emails. Thanks, have a great holiday. Thanks, Ms. Baden. Uh, since there are no other advisory or stakeholders, the uh, next section of our meeting is public comment. The first speaker is Shuli Jha. Good evening. Um, dear PUE members, this is Shu Nixia. I'm the founder of Chinese American Parent Association of Baltimore County. Today, I'm here to ask the PUE members to take steps to further cultural awareness and to create a true inclusive and diverse public school system. Almost 30 years ago, Jewish parents came to the PUE meetings to ask for recognition of their holidays in their community. They were the pioneers for cultural awareness. About a decade ago, Muslim parents came to BOE meetings and brought up the issue of equality. All this inspired us Chinese American parents, the first generation of immigrants, to follow the footsteps of these pioneers <coughs> and to voice out our knowings for, knowings for recognition, fairness, and equality. We are here to ask when it comes to recognize holidays, treat every ethnic group the same way, either by closing, closing school for individual holidays or create an international day to celebrate an inclusive community. The demography of Baltimore County has changed over the last decades. I was at the BOE meeting when discussing the 2017 school calendar. I heard there was a operational reason for just, to justify some school closing, and there was argument about data to support this. 
But in my opinion, the data is irrelevant and doesn't matter. No matter how big the data is, it is hard to justify recognizing the culture of one race with big pop population and closing school, but ignore the culture and identity needs for other race with small population. Therefore, to have an international day is a creative way to accommodate the cultural awareness needs of family from all races without impacting school operation. I have to state that this is a moment to do so it will, as it will bring un, uh, unity to our community and to help the division of our country after this year's election. It will once and for all solve struggles about the holidays, eliminate endless petition, testimony, and public hearings, and save our precious time and energy to focus on important issues such as academic achievement. So this is our culture. Always respect each, each other and learn from each other. This is a culture of Chinese people with 5,000 years of history. This is, a, this is a culture we are proud of. This is a culture we bring with us to contribute to this country. This is a culture we want the society to be aware of. And this is a culture we want acceptance. Last but, uh, but not least, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Guinness and Ms. Johnson to, uh, for being the new chair and vice chair. I also want to thank Ms. Uh, McDaniel for your excellent leadership. I also want to express my welcome to Ms. Haynes. I heard a lot of, uh, about you from my friend Nini. I want to thank all the other BOE members for your hard work and um, dedication for public education. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, Ms. Zhao. The next speaker is Pat Hundley. Mr. Hunley, every time that I've been a board chair, you've been here. <laughs> it's been wonderful. <laughs> Hopefully my voice will hold up. All uh, right. Thank you all for uh, letting me come and speak again. And again, I'd like to reiterate that I'm not here to complain about my principal. She's fantastic. But the issue is, as I'm going to say, according to the published article in the Sun paper and the statistics of the Maryland State Department of Education, 41% of our incoming kindergartners were considered ready for kindergarten based on the information from the kindergarten ready exam last year. And those of us in the trenches would agree with that assessment. These children are being held to a very high standard, facing very rigorous academic goals, considering their level of readiness. And they are often expected to be self-directed and work in groups or independently throughout the day. I often compare these incoming kindergartners to six-month-old Labrador Labrador Retriever puppies. They have, all, they have undis, unrivaled desire to please and endless energy, and they are unequaled in their willingness to attempt to accomplish a task, but too often lack the maturity to solve the myriad of problems that arise while working independently. Our task is not unlike throwing those puppies onto a field and rounding them up by sundown meanwhile teaching them to retrieve in the process. They're all capable, but they need individual attention and support. During the day, we have three different center times. We have phonics, literacy centers, and math centers. Those centers can consist of four differentiated groups with as many as up to six or seven children per group. Each center time may have as many as four different activities going at four different ability levels. One of the centers is where we work with the small groups to either reteach or extend or work on particular skills. If we could work or support these children in these small groups without interruption, like having to constantly redirect those children that are expected to work independently or helping a child log on to a computer because they hit the caps button, or maybe cleaning up spilled paint or solving bathroom issues or calling the custodian the guidance counselor, principal, or nurse on a phone that's across the room, or chasing the runner down the hall, or putting out any other little fires that pop up, our effectiveness would be greatly enhanced. Many of our students do not have the ability, not for lack of desire, to accomplish these tasks without the support of an adult that is already, that is at the ready to help solve these small problems. Kindergarten teachers are, are in need of support and we need someone who can help solve these problems that take the teacher away from the small group and interrupt the flow of the lesson that's been specifically designed to meet the needs of those group, those children. Basically, we're asking for some help. Half day would be wonderful. Half day for every teacher in the county. I know it's expensive, but we need that help. Thank you, Mr. Hunley. Our third speaker is Diana Bergman.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Bergman, and I live in the Southwest area. I'm not here today to complain about any of my schools because I love them all, from the elementary schools all the way to the middle school and the high school. What I'm here to talk about is I want to make you guys aware of something that I experienced last school year as a parent. I was able to attend one of BCPS um, job fair that you guys held. And I noticed something that kind of stuck with me last year, and I didn't really voice it. But um, I got to see each of the departments at the job fair, and they were amazing. Each department shared what they were doing in their department and what interest that they needed for support as they were hiring. However, after you got to meet them, you ended up in the human resource department. And that's where I think needs some improvement for BCPS. Our human resource department, you're kind of treated as just a person in the line. Um, you go in, you submit your resume, they ask you what department you would like to work for, and they give you a link. Link here, link here, take this course, test, whatever it is that you were going in for, and then you move on to the next phase. And I think that's the spot right there where we could improve. We could improve to change things that we are currently dealing with as I talk to parents on social media countywide and some educators where we were frustrated because we have had administrators that have left in the middle of the school year. We have had educators that the second quarter hasn't even begun and they left our students. And not for medical reasons or because they're having a child, um, for whatever the reason might be. Um, but I think it starts from that first introduction to BCPS. If you're going to the human research department to go get a job, you want to feel like you can make a difference. That's for anybody, education, any job. You want to feel like you can make a difference. We want our teachers, our administrators, our educators, our supporting staff in BCPS and team BCPS to feel that they're making a difference in our children's life. And as a parent, I want to make sure that happens with the minimum possible. And we have a shortage of substitute teachers. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I, we could figure out how to make it better. So I hope today, by me speaking up and mentioning how the process begins for anyone that's coming into Team BCS, Team BCPS, that you come in feeling from the first person you greet as a Team BCPS member that you can make that difference because each and every student is relying on that. As young as their minds are, they want to make sure you're there to make that difference for them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. Life is simply a sport. Therefore, you must be prepared for it with a winning attitude and mental toughness. Tonight, I want to share with you a few sports concepts I've learned. And I've learned it by the things that have happened in our world in terms of elections, experience uh, interacting at the board meetings. And um, I want to give you this concept about basketball. <laughs> now, we have street basketball and we have organized basketball. When you're playing street ball, if your opponent plays dirty, that could be an invitation for you to play dirty in return. You don't whine, complain, or argue about the rules. You accept it and just play tough until someone wins. Whoever wins the game wins respect. The team who lost can't argue about the outcome or the winning or the uh, winning technique of the opponent, opponent because they set the precedence or the tone of the game. You will also find in sports that typically when everything is going right and you're winning, your teammates get along well and everyone has team spirit. However, when obstacles come and your teammates are caught off guard with the opponent's approach to winning, some teammates may point fingers, have side conversations about what should have happened, and you may hear a few I told you so's. 
Another interesting dynamic in team sports is when individuals' personalities clash and the team loses sight of the mission and vision. For example, the last board meeting, Mrs. Miller brought up some game-changing concerns regarding the equity policy. She was pointing out some important concerns about the equity policy, which is high on Dr. Dance's list. Now, there may be some leadership tension between Dr. Dance and Mrs. Miller, but when you want to win for all children, you must compromise and be peaceful with the people you may not like personally or support professionally. Further, Mrs. Miller mentioned that the PRC should review the equity policy again because of how it could be costly for the school systems legally, uh, financially. However, everyone voted against her suggestion knowing there was so much work to do on this policy. In fact, the equity policy doesn't even have superintendent rules. Now, if I was a referee, I would say that last week's decision was a turnover, creating an opportunity for your opponents to win, which is a great feat because all people should win, not just people with political power and money. I'm running out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and for anyone who hears me, Happy Holiday, whichever holiday a person believes and enjoys. And so as you can see, you know, this holiday is really not about shopping, at least in my, in my view. It's really about peace. It's about thinking of others, working for others to improve others. It's not about I, it's about taking care of the community and the family and friends and everybody around. And in all the years that I have worked in this Board of Education in my capacity, I want to say to you, failure is really failure to try. It's not about outcome. So. I hope that we work as a school system to have excellent students in math, algebra, science, and make them good business leaders. But again, I really call on you to think about teaching values. You know, to have business people and professionals in the future that really would have moral integrity. And to be active and not really just sit on the sidelines and enjoy the work of others. In mentioning activism, I mentioned this to you, that the stakeholder system is very inactive in my observation. You know, today is another example. Some of the teachers come in and use public speaking three minutes to address their concerns. That should be really through the stakeholders. Even some of the parents talk about things the stakeholders really do talk about, which really takes away time from the public like myself. So I hope you would address these concerns and you know, these thoughts. Um, again, happy holiday. It's about peace and love and care towards others. And as I and everybody enjoyed the singing out there, I just remind you that there are other people who like to do the same thing in whichever faith they believe in or whichever culture they believe in. And I really hope that the board would come up with something that unifies rather than showing one or two groups being happy and everybody else is not really so happy. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Fron. Our next speaker is Sanjay Sharma.
Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm Sanjay, and I'm representing the Padonia International School. I'm the president of PTA there. Uh, personally, I just moved to Baltimore only about three years back after 20 years in Utah. Uh, I'll keep my stuff very short. And uh, first, I want to say that I'm very happy to see the recommendation uh, for additional construction at Pedonia. So thank you. Thank you for all of you for actually working on that. Uh, special thanks to all the executives who helped us on this. I want to acknowledge the efforts of all the teachers, the community members, and, and this means a lot to the school there. Um, my, both my daughters go to the, the international school, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I think the recommendation is in the right direction. So thank you from bottom of my heart. Also wanted to appreciate the efforts of the principal of the school there, Ms. Di Donato. Um, in my personally biased opinion, I think she's one of the best principal that we have here. Uh, not only she's a fabulous teacher, I think she's a wonderful role model for many teachers. And, uh, and another thing, which I think she's going to get very upset with me because I'm going to tell this, she's also a fashion model. Uh, <laughs> she participated in our Festival of Lights event uh, last month. And uh, it's these small things that she does which brings the community together and, and uh, makes everyone there feel part of, uh, part of this larger community. I sincerely hope that there will be more schools, such as Pedona International School, so that uh, kids here, or the elementary school kids, get an, an overall understanding of diversity, which I think is very important, not only for Baltimore, but for the whole country. And since I have only 53 seconds left, um, my last comment here is about, uh, so I see a lot of uh, Asians who move to this area, and after a couple of years, they want to run away to Howard County. And like, oh, the Howard County Board of Education, Howard County has the best education and all that. And uh, while I personally disagree with them, uh, I, this, I do agree that there are some uh, rooms for improvement here. And uh, I would want all of us to work together and make sure that uh, our BCPS or our education system becomes best in Maryland. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bing Cao. Um, dear board member, uh, good evening and ha happy holiday. Um, before the most important American holiday season, uh, we um, Chinese American Parents Association of Baltimore County would like to suggest uh, BOE to recognize, uh, to consider to recognize the most important Asian holiday, uh, which is almost equal to um, Christmas here, uh, the Lunar New Year days. The holiday has been celebrated by 13 uh, Asian countries, by, by one face of the world population, and in the past 4,000 years. Uh, we hope, you know, BOE could consider to combine the Lunar New Year days with one of uh, BOE's other January, February professional development day. That will give the school age uh, uh, um, Asian American kids the precious chance to celebrate not only the holiday, but also the rich uh, Asian tradition. Not only celebrate together their, with their own parents, but also with their grandparents who are so, uh, tens of thousands of miles away. On the day, the family member missing each other the most. I still remember the first Lunar um, New Year Day I had in America back in 2003. Only three months after I started my first job in Hopkins, I was too shy to ask my boss to take a vacation day. So I thought I could manage the day by just calling my and greeting my parents for a few minutes. When the New Year bill runs, uh, that's middle night, you know, bill runs in China, which is around 11 a.m. our Baltimore uh, local time. That was a terrible, terrible mistake I ever made. I was upset with homesick the whole morning and hardly even get out of the ladies' room with pronounced right eye, where, in, where in, you know, I had to make the phone call to settle myself down. And 
after that, I never come to work on the Lunar New Year Day anymore. Since not able to com continue the most important tradition in my life, make me feel I was cut off from all my past, from all the people and the things I value the most. Since then, I also learned no matter how many school, important school tests, assignment, or activity may be missed, I need always keep my son at home on that day so she, he can call his dearest grandparent together with me the, minute, the minutes when the Chinese New Year bill runs. I really want the love, the affection, the support, and the care within our big family could be observed and passed on to my son as the invaluable heritage he could probably get from his ancestor. Uh, Lunar New Year is not only a holiday for Asians, it's the, the holy ritual for Asian family to display and ensure a strong love and support within a family. And it could be the most valuable things passed on. A, a Thank you very much. Our next, our next speaker is Steve Weber. Hi, how you doing? Good evening. Thanks, Good evening. thanks for having me. I'm back again. I was here about a month and a half ago to address you guys about the issue with uh, discipline issues in school, new teacher problems. So I'm back again. I, I don't see anything happening, and the 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 issue is. Your, your, your students are being failed in these schools. And I'm going to read off the, the middle schools and the park test results. I'm using the park test results as how I measure what schools are having problems. And I know what's causing these park test failures of these schools. Student discipline issues, your new teachers are leaving because they cannot teach in these schools. And it's also a parenting issue. I'm not going to just say it's school, student discipline. But these schools are at the bottom of my list. I'm going to read them to you because I don't think you guys get it. I'm sorry. So I'm going to go through the list. You have four superintendents. Each one has a good school, and each one has failing schools. They know what's happening in the good schools, and they know what's happening in these failing schools. It's not any big mystery. But I do not see anything being done to correct this issue. And I'm going to give Mr. Roberts a big round of applause. He has spent time with me, spent time talking to me about what is being done, but I don't see it working. Your park test scores this year are worse than they were last year. No improvement. Nothing. Let me read through your scores. Hereford, 11. This is the average of all the kids in the schools that are testing at level one, level two, level one, level two. A level one test score equates to a 200 on an SA2. SAT score. That's in your website. Studies have been done to show that. It is horrible. These are the percentage of students that are testing level one and level two in these schools. Hereford, 11.6 percent. Ridgely, 16.2 percent. Perry Hall, 22.8. Fantastic results. Goes down. Parkville Middle Center Technology, 24 percent. Sunbrook Magnet. I'm sorry with boring with these data, but I got to get through to you guys. Dunbarton Middle, 27% are in level one. Cockersville, 28%. Catonsville, 33%. Pine Grove Middle, 35 Sparrows Point Middle, 44 Franklin, 46 Pikesville, 49 49% of the kids are testing level one, level two. We're not done yet. Lock Raven Tech, 51%. Deer Park Piddle, 51%. Middle, Middle River, 56%. Deep Creek Middle, 56%. Southwest Academy, 57%. I'm going to go down quick. Golden Ring Middle, 59 percent. Stemmers Run, 60 percent. General John Stricter, 61 percent are testing level one and level two. Gets worse. Woodlong, 64 percent. Hollowbird Middle, 68 percent are testing level. Dundalk, 72 percent. Old Court Middle, 72 percent. Lansdowne, 73 percent. Fix this problem. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Our next speaker is Lily Rowe. Hi. Good evening. So, you know that I admin the group BCPS Parents and Teachers for Equitable Facilities and Portable AC, and there's about 3,000 people in that group and there's other social media things I monitor and over the last couple of weeks 
Reisterstown Elementary School had um, minor plumbing problems that didn't interrupt the school day. Those minor plumbing, uh, plumbing problems were reported in social media by parents and teachers at the school as a sewage leak closing all the bathrooms so the children could not flush the toilets or wash their hands. And the sewage ended up flooding out a kindergarten, at least one kindergarten classroom. And by the end of the day, service had possibly not been restored and nothing had been sanitized. The answers people were given by the custodial staff is, well, it's dry. And upon further crowdsourcing information, it has come to my attention that BCPS does not utilize bleach or anything that will kill norovirus. So norovirus is the vi stomach virus that makes children puke their brains out for about 24 hours and spreads through every single member of the household over the space of a week and a half. And it, it can stay active in feces and urine for up to two weeks after symptoms. Which means when you have sewage that's spreading through kindergarten classrooms and kids don't wash their hands, that's a, a, just a disaster for spreading stomach viruses. But even in an everyday school like the ones my children go to where we don't have severe plumbing problems, I have had in the last two months three cases where all eight members of my family have, over the space of a week and a half, puked their brains out. Do you have any idea how much laundry that produces? How much bleach I've had to use to sanitize my whole entire house? And in the process of discussing this on social media, a lot of other families are experiencing the same thing. And I would appreciate it if the breeding ground for mutations of the norovirus, which is the school system, would use something that kills stomach viruses to clean the schools. And I have not been able to ascertain from any custodial staff or anyone any substance which is used that actually sanitizes. The thing I find most ironic is that Baltimore County Public Schools has been given to oversee daycare centers by the state of Maryland. And in the oversight of the daycare centers, Baltimore County Public Schools mandates that toys, bedding, and all sorts of things in daycare centers be bleached. So why do we not do the same thing for the schools that Thank you, Thank you Ms. Rowe. Our last speaker is Nina Sir. Hello, um, I'm the parent of a student at Patapsco High School Center of the Arts. Um, I was coming here tonight to speak about the facilities plan. Uh, we're one of the schools that's luckily getting renovations. You had an update on the facilities plan posted October 25th. I couldn't come in November, we had a play. So I came tonight. I wanted to talk about some of the things on there that I saw that I had concerns about. But before the meeting, I had the chance to talk to Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit, and <laughs> <laughs> you guys covered all of my things. I'm very, very grateful for that. The one thing that they couldn't assure me, however, is that part of the plan for the renovations is that we're getting several temporary classrooms because you're going to have to close down some of the building in order to rip up the plumbing and so on and so forth. One of the big problems, the, the biggest problem at Patapsco High School is that we're over, we've got too many kids. We're 200 over now. We're going, just getting more in. They're, they've approved some new buildings just behind the giant. It's, it's gonna be really crowded. Um, the temporary classrooms that we're getting are, I'm told, truly temporary. And this is, if I'd like the board to consider making those temporary classrooms that we're getting for the term of the construction slightly less than temporary. We've got nine temporary classrooms right now. We're getting eight more. I realize this is difficult for the kids. The temporary classrooms we've got right now, the floor kind of creaks a little bit when you walk. I know I'm heavy, but the floor creaks. Um, and so I'd like you to consider letting them keep the temporary classrooms as a stopgap measure once the renovations are complete so that we don't have such an overcrowding problem. And 
Thanks. Thank you very much. And the next item on our agenda, uh, item F, is personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Ms. White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next item on our agenda, item G, is an update on facilities, and I invite Mr. Smith to come forward. And Mr. Dixon. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Ms. White, and members of the board. Happy holidays. Um, it is Happy indeed that time you. of year where we um, enjoy family and friends and um, the spirit of joy and happiness. Um, I'm joined today by uh, our Executive Director of Facilities, Physical Facilities, Mr. Pete Dixit. We're going to give you an update on the, our facilities uh, as we move through the uh, various projects that we have. In addition to um, tonight, us being the, the voice and the face of many, many, many men and women who work extremely hard every day to make our more than 200 facilities go and to make sure that the environment for our students are the most safe and well-maintained that we can bring to you today. I think you already know that Baltimore County is a very large school district. Um, we're the 25th largest in the country, and by these numbers you can clearly see that makes sense. Um, we service more than 200 buildings, over 16 million square feet of space that is maintained every single day, every single month, every single school year. Um, from that, we have about 4,000 acres of property uh, that we maintain on a daily basis with our staff in conjunction with county personnel as well. Um, of those 200 school buildings, 170 Three of them house our school centers and programs, and the rest are, are a combination of offices throughout the county. BCPS has over 1,500 facility-based um, personnel. The lion's share of that, over 1,000 of them, are school-based, are centered in various schools throughout our um, entire footprint, and they all take extreme pride and pleasure in maintaining their schools. It's sort of their place in this large, massive organization in this county. They take it very seriously. And we have a lot of folks here today and are listening that um, wanted to be here to stand behind us. But um, what I'd like to tell them is I'm glad that we can sit here and stand for them because they stand for us every single day in those classrooms. I get those emails when we have issues and all of that, but guess what? They're the folks on the front line that make it happen, and I'm proud of them each and every day. It is not an easy task, but I think they do it to the best of their ability. Um, of course, you know that we have two funding, physical funding sources, the local and the state portion. The local is about 55 percent and the state is about 45 percent. That could fluctuate throughout the different budget cycles. We don't have um, our own funding authority. The revenue and bonds, uh, the revenue funding capacity of the county and the state is set by limits based on the request of our request and what the bond limits for both the state and the local can support. As you can see here, our annual, on average, our annual operating budget is about $126 million, um, and our um, average annual capital is about $140 million annual. That's on average. So it sometimes, some years is higher and some, sometimes it's lower. 
All of this is done through our strategic plan, which is the Blueprint 2.0. Once again, any any good organization, in order to become great, you have to have a strategic plan as to, to direct your focus and to lead you through this work. And we consider ourselves um, major contributors to that work. We do this work to support teaching and learning. We do this work to support teaching and learning. I'll say it one more time. We do this work to support teaching and learning. It's not about buildings and acres. It's about teaching and learning. And the team, what we're trying to do is to make sure that that is how we look at our work, not as, not as a person who is just cutting grass. It's cutting grass to support our youngsters to have the best opportunity in what we do. So this team is proud to do that work. Through that, our service model is how we deliver um, our services for all of our students. As you can see, with, from the, the superintendent has shared with you many times before, that work all centers around the student and the principal. All of our activities, all of our support models feed into that. And as you can see in this description here, these are the, this is the service model concept that leads us through this work to make sure we stay focused on providing what the schools need based on what the, the principals and the students need each and every day. Now, I just gave you a general overview. I have this gentleman beside me now who's going to really get into the details that can provide more of the um, refined information that we have. Um, Pete Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening to everybody again. Uh, Blueprint 2.0, the Department of Facilities supports the entire Blueprint 2.0. But there are two goals in there that you are familiar with, goals two and four, that are specifically targeted for the facilities. The, two, the goal two is a healthy environment for all students, and goal four is preparing a plan to address all needs of, of the facility needs for the school system. Our mission is to make sure that we place, we, we provide an environment for 21st century learning to all the students every day and in all communities for each and every day. Uh, the, the facilities phases for the building, and this is what we would like to spend a few minutes. There are three distinct phases for facilities. The first, obviously, is when it's constructed and we call construction phase. It's followed by continuously operating the facilities. That's the second phase. And the third phase is maintaining those facilities to the standard that is needed for delivering the 21st century education all the time. In order to do that, what we have done here is given a sampling of some of the functions and the skilled personnel needed to, to handle those functions on a daily basis. For the operations phase, what we do is manage the energy, manage waste, clean facilities, organize use of facilities, and sustainability. Now, in order to perform that, the different skills that are needed are obviously the building service workers, uh, a stationary engineer to operate the plant, and energy management. And we'll talk about energy management later on in our presentation and maybe in one of the items that we'll request your approval later on. For the maintenance, you will see that there's preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance, um, property management, it's all kind of all kind of services that are needed. And the skill sets needed is just too numerous to say, from carpenter to electricians to mechanics to welders, storekeeper. And we have these facilities in-house, and we also have these services on contract. Each and every maintenance request is evaluated as to how fast, how cost-efficient, and how can we perform it in the, in the most optimum manner to provide the best service. The construction is something that we talk to you in building services all the time, bring all the contracts here. It, the, the service is in designing and space planning and uh, uh, in, in, in the renovation of this, adding air conditioning to the building, and the skill sets needed are space planners, architects, 
mechanical engineers, structural engineers, civil engineers, CAD operator, and these services, again, we have a team, a group of people inside that do this, and this is augmented by the contract architects and contract consultants. Some of the major accomplishment, one of the biggest accomplishment that we are very proud of, that on an annual basis, there are 25,000 requests that are coming. We take pride in providing these services 24 hours, seven days a week, all 365 days. We have a number, a common number, where a request can be, uh, a maintenance request can be called upon, and there's 25,000. While you listen from time to time about one or two maintenance requests that we may not have done to this standard, even at the 99% reliability, there'll be a few hundred that we may not be able to do. But this is the, 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 the quantity of repair and, and, and work that is needed. We wanted to share that with you. The, in, in the operations side, what we have been able to achieve is $1.8 million of annual energy cost of items for the last several years, ever since we got in the business of buying energy commodities on the open market. Now, this is the cost avoidance every year in a $30 million budget that we have for utilities. This is, is it, it is only in the energy commodities area Further savings are realized by improving the efficiency of buildings, by, uh, by, uh, by using alternate financing methods like energy performance contracting, like utilizing uh, efficient boilers and chillers, and operating the plant in the most efficient manner. There's a, we, uh, there's this uh, emphasis on recycling and sustainability, and we have 20% increase in our recycling rate that we are very proud of. Uh, the other part is the capital improvement. Since 2012, when the superintendent started, uh, we have done more than 600 projects at a cost of $800 million. This is $800 million from in, the, in the time span of about four, little over four years, and more than 600 projects. This is, uh, this is one of the achievements that we are especially proud of because you wouldn't see too many school systems accomplish, ac accomplishing that type, that amount of work. And this is not completed yet. We are still going on. And we have air conditioned 37 schools. While we hear about a lot of schools that are not air conditioned, we take pride in air conditioning so many schools in the right manner in the shortest amount of time. While we have done all of this, there are challenges that are ahead. Uh, our, our school system is old. Average building age is more than 30 years, 32, 35 years, somewhere in there. And old infrastructure imposes tremendous amount of challenge to us in maintaining that. The other, uh, the other challenge that we have here is improving our communication with communities and with board and we are making an honest attempt on a daily basis to continue to improve it. And these, uh, one of the other challenges that I see is creating flexible spaces for the technological learning of the 21st century. This is a different type of space. This is a different pedagogy that we are dealing in the 21st century, and that's a challenge for all of us. Um, how do we meet some of these challenges? Uh, you are aware of our air conditioning efforts. There's another 20 to 22 schools that we'll be completing uh, in next six, six to eight months before the next school opening. There are four high school renovations that are going on, and every year we are building one, two, or three elementary schools to handle the uh, enrollment increases, population increases. And the final challenge is for the old infrastructure, how do you take the vintage schools and convert them for uh, 21st century learning spaces? That are some of the challenges that we face on a daily basis. This was a quick summary 
uh, of, uh, the, of, of what we do in the time that we have been allotted. We'd love to talk about it all evening, but we know the time is limited. So right now, we'll leave it for questions. One other thing, we want to thank this board and our superintendent for our support as we go through this. Um, we, we realize this is not easy work to do, but your support um, to our children and to our team to make Team BCPS what it is, we're excited about that. We appreciate our support from our county funding and our state funding agencies as well. That's the, all of those uh, teams coming together is, is really what makes us go. So we thank you for all your support and we were available to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit, thank you very much for that presentation as you have done and as the system has done in the last couple of years in December. Uh, we appreciate the facilities update. Are there questions of either Mr. Smith or Mr. Dixit at this time? Ms. Miller. Thank you. Um, I solicited for and received uh, um, input from stakeholders on facilities, so I have a number of questions which I will ask on behalf of stakeholders. Um, first, uh, and this has been addressed to the board, is issues of uh, overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle and High School. Um, and interestingly, one of the issues raised about overcrowding is um, whether or not that meets fire safety codes. If a school is, say, over 110 percent or more over capacity. Could you address that issue? I'll, I'll start with the first part and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixit. The first part is we work very closely with strategic planning to uh, study our enrollment growth and capacity throughout the system. Um, certainly Perry Hall Middle School is certainly our largest middle school and we support the principal and their staff with uh, the support they need in order to deliver the quality instruction they do every day. Um, uh, we have to adhere to um, safety um, capacity concerns is within any uh, public facility in the state of Maryland, so we do adhere to that. But with the size of that school, and uh, it requires uh, a delicate um, approach to it because it is a large school and you have to provide some dish, some extra supports in order to make that work. Um, I think that the principals there now and the principal that was there before um, understands that that uniqueness of that school and um, what we've asked our team to do is to to look at it as certainly as one of our 173 center schools and programs but it, it, it may have a uh, um, additional um, nuances that we have to address. We have uh, provided additional safety um, through our uh, school safety departments, um, safety audit um, responses to make sure that as we assess um, um, student safety and uh, egress and ingress, we are doing that with uh, the full breadth and depth of what's happening in that school every day. We are not aware of any safety or fire code violation at Perry Hall Middle School or at any other school in the system. And if we are ever informed about it, if we ever find it, we take immediate action. Do you know if there is a certain percentage over capacity that would then violate fire safety codes? I'm not aware of that, but we can definitely look Sir, into we'll it. Look we can look into it. But we are not aware of any fire code violation or any safety violation in Perry Hall Middle School. I, have a f I think Mrs. Miller is asking if there's a capacity number, if there's a, a, an ultimate number that can be in a building at one time. We have schools that are more than 110 percent, but it, it is not a code violation of any kind. And we, once again, we work closely with strategic planning, our, our folks, to address those. It may be with um, temporary structures as it relates to relocatables and things of that nature to help offset um, the um, space, the footprint, the building footprint that we have. Um, an example of that was um, one of the uh, speakers who mentioned about uh, relocatables at Patapsco. You know, you have to. Uh, have those relocatable classrooms in order to augment as these schools are being renovated, additions are being included, or replacement schools. It, you know, there's a systematic approach, and I think we work very well with uh, strategic planning and our funding partners in order to try to make that 
that process as smooth as possible. So, Mr. Smith, it's important at that point to have everyone remember that that we're not a we don't have an independent funding source, and we respond we uh, we respond uh, to the funds we get from our funding sources, the state and the county, and capacity and other issues are matters that really uh, need to also uh, be focused and addressed at the state and county levels. Additionally, I would say that the um, capacity is based on the ed specs and not necessarily on fire code. So um, in terms of the, the scheduling that has to happen, that's what principal considers to make sure that there aren't uh, fire code violations. We do anticipate that there will be a middle school project uh, to speak directly to overcrowding in FY19. Thank you. Um, I have several questions, so I don't know if other people have them. You can. So we're going to try to uh, make good use of our time, Mrs. Miller. Um, uh, you've had the floor for six or seven minutes now, and there's others that I think want to ask questions. So if you'd ask another question, then we'll move on to the next board member. Okay. Can you talk about the uh, the Reisterstown Elementary School recurring plumbing problem? As, from my understanding, it's been more than just once or twice. It's been an ongoing issue. Do you know what the problem is? From what I know, I can share with you. I looked at the total record of the uh, maintenance issues for, for one complete year. There were about 35 to 40 maintenance requests that we received, which is very Typical, normal for that vintage school. The school was built in 1962 or 63. So for a 50-year-old facility to receive 40 or 50 uh, maintenance requests in a year is not an abnormally high number. I also looked at our response, and in, in, in all of the cases that I saw, the responses were reasonable, reasonable time. None of them were long time. None of them were the responses that uh, really raised any concern. Now, out of and that... Let me just add one. That wasn't 35 plumbing issues. That was 35 to 40 maintenance in a host of, of various different capacities. And that's my question. Yes. How much of that is this, this recurring I, I don't have problem. the exact number, but all that I can say that I did not notice anything that was unusually high for that building. Um, my concern is the recurring nature of it. I mean, you might come out and respond right away and get it fixed for that moment, but obviously there's some underlying problem. And can you talk on that? Do you know so, what the underlying the issue is? Some of the problems that are happening are not necessarily always the same problem. So um, what we're tr trying to assess is sometimes when we get calls related to the most recent ones, they didn't appear to be the same type of problem. It may have resulted in the same outcome, but not the same type of problem. So we have to assess each individual um, occurrence and then develop a plan of action from that. So we're continuing to work with the principal and the school community to make sure that we're providing whatever support that's needed for that building. But uh, as we said before, we, we don't think we have anything absorbent. But once again, we, we are looking at all of our facilities on an ongoing basis annually to see whether or not there's, um, if there's something uh, particularly that we need to address on an ongoing basis. We now, you know, will continue to watch the plumbing in this particular school just to make sure sure that we're providing whatever support that's needed, but um, at this point in time, we can't pinpoint it to just one thing, um, one problem, because if so, we would have certainly tried to address it. Sometimes it may be a, a myriad of problems as we explore. Very thank good. You. I see that um, Mrs. Johnson had her hand up. Ms. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Pete and Kevin, for, um, for everything that you do, your quick responses, the, the 4,000 acres of property that you oversee, and more importantly, or equally as importantly, the team that does stand behind you. That 200 plus buildings, um, that's a lot of buildings to clean. Do you guys use bleach? Uh, not on a regular basis, because um, uh, bleach has other issues with it. Uh, but if that's what health department recommends, we use that. Under our uh, green program, Bleach is not one of the chemical that is encouraged to use when the kids are in the building. Not that we never use it, but very rarely. Okay, and what, if you know off the top of your head, what cleaning product do you use that would be equivalent to bleach as far as killing the viruses that are, that are con some of the parents' concerns? 
we use green product. I don't have the name of the product. We can certainly get we that. We can certainly get that for you. Um, but yes. these are all approved, EPA approved, uh, health department approved product. product. And, and with some of these products and sort of while we're kind of going to the green, we, ha we also have to be mindful of 112,000 students with varying degrees of allergenic yeah. um, concerns. So um, certainly we, we, we realize the power of bleach, <laughs> but at the same token, we have to we have to utilize that in a in a in a responsibly and safe manner as it relates to students' varying needs as it relates to allergies and other things like that. So um, we try to find other substitutes that um, have the same purpose that are approved by the state as well as um, um, our clean um, our clean efforts to have a clean building. Great, thank you, um, and. Pete, thank you so much. You and I spoke about um, a particular elementary school over the summer, or late, late, uh, late summer, early fall. Um, and I asked about a mold protocol. And would you share if, if you guys do have any sort of mold protocol? If not, what kind of, if, if you get a work order because a teacher, or administrator, or staff person noticed mold in the school, what actions are taken after that? Well, uh, let me tell you one thing, that the mold spores are present everywhere in every environment. It is the conditions that convert mold, the, the spore into mold is what we are concerned about. And any time there is any slightest doubt of mold, the first thing we see is that our, do we have enough air circulation? Is there enough light there? Is, there? is the area clean? Is there any reason to have excessive moisture there? The conditions, and we have, we have folks that are trained in this field, in the field of uh, industrial hygiene, they are certified, and they have access to licensed and certified folks. And there's a defined protocol for that, and we implement it if there is any remotest possibility of mold, presence of mold. Thank you. But the key thing is removing the condition that might be, that might be causing conversion of a spore into mold. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. One bullet on one of your slides uh, referred to sustaining a continually aging school inventory. And one of the things I kind of struggle with each year when we come to the operating budget is what portion, is, you know, we have limited funds, but what portion of that operating budget is appropriate to assign to the maintenance of these aging buildings? We have a lot of problems and um, we have other educational issues to address, but could you just speak on how you get to what that right number is with all these aging buildings, how do we know we're not putting enough into that bucket or, or how, how, how is that decision arrived? Well, um, in a previous slide it indicated that it was two funding sources. That's the first funding source is the, the general operating budget for facilities. Um, that budget is for your day-to-day -day maintenance that takes place, um, as well as all the personnel that is that, that we utilize in order to, to operate the buildings. From that, some of the general maintenance can take place. Um, as the infrastructure with Schools for Our Future is coming online, that was a 10-year uh, pr program to sort of uh, address um, three issues. Um, growth and capacity to, to increase more seats, um, to a, assist in getting um, our uh, schools that don't have AC, getting them AC, and the third piece is to find the right footprint for aging infrastructure, whether that's renovation, replacement, or additions. And so through that, um, uh, unfortunately, in the business that we're in, there's we can't tell you a dollar amount in, unless you tore every building down now and replace them right now. I could tell you how how you could maintain it from going forward because you have buildings that were built in different time, uh, different years. So it has a uh, a life cycle that 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 is different for practically each and every one. How we how we approach it is making sure that the buildings that are um, on our uh, replacements for roof and, and various systems are, are looked at um, as we go through the process of the capital planning. Um, and that'll be something we'll discuss a little bit later tonight. So it's a, it's a capital and a general operating um, and how we do that. And some of those projects related to uh, um, needing l l larger um, 
funding infusions will take place from the capital side as opposed to the operating, which is more small um, um, spot, um, on the spot repairs and, and maintenance. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit, I do uh, also want to thank you for your um, hard work and your diligence. And I also want to say that as I have been around the county visiting schools, I definitely have observed very hardworking and diligent building operation personnel. They absolutely yes. care about the children and they care about the staff. Um, and, and that is what's important. The building is what supports the education and the learning. And they certainly understand that taking care of the buildings is what helps take care of the students and the teachers and allows for that proper environment. Um, with that said, I do want to say that the uh, struggles and the uh, limitations that we have in doing everything that we want to do is a matter of two things, uh, well, three things, the dollars that are allotted, uh, the priorities of where those dollars go, and, and how those decisions are made, where do we allot those dollars. And I want to point out um, that at the end of the county executive schools for our future plan uh, for facilities, um, where he refuses to even consider portable AC, that when we do get to the final air conditioning in schools that are at the end of our list, which is 2021 for the late, for the uh, replacement schools, Correct. Baltimore County will have taken 20 additional years longer than Anne Arundel County to cool all of our schools. So while there is progress being made, um, I would suggest that this board and everyone that else that is involved in making decisions of where those dollars go, when they go there, and for what they um, are supposed to accomplish, that we do a better job of analyzing that. And part of that is the board understanding more of what's happening, and I appreciate you um, taking the time to work on this presentation for us. Um, but we had also, uh, it had been asked to have an update on the uh, air conditioning, not just for the schools that we know that don't have it, but for schools that had problems with it. It was asked for at a board meeting back in September. Um, and also when some research was being done around that issue, there were some heating issues that came up as possibilities. So um, I, I'd like to ask you, number one, when is a complete heating and air conditioning uh, facilities update going to be given to the board? Because we're supposed to vote on the state, uh, excuse me, the county capital request on January 10th, and I would consider it imprudent for us to make decisions uh, over, you know, those millions of dollars if we don't have a proper understanding of where our system is. And so. as, as you know, Ms. Causey, as I, I responded to uh, the board earlier today, uh, the, um, the administration has plans to complete its inventory of schools and to deliver that information to the board at the second meeting in January. So after we're supposed to vote on the county capital construction fund okay. request. So not, not the best planning, uh, even though the, that request was made in early September. Um, the other, so the question I have is in the Schools for a Future plan that was presented on December 9th of 2014, it recommended a replacement for Reisterstown and Bedford Elementary Schools. Um, but in this current version of uh, Schools for a Future, Reisterstown Elementary School is not slated for a replacement, nor is it even slated for an addition. Uh, but at the same time, we have Fort Garrison getting an addition, which is under capacity. So my question is, and I and and uh, unfortunately the superintendent is not here, who's really the one that should be answering that question. How are these decisions made? Um, because we're, as a board, we are supposed to vote on these, even though we're not our own funding source. Um, so it is up to us to make informed decisions. So I don't understand why some of those projects have lost their priority. Well, each year we assess our enrollment and our capacity throughout the district. And um, as populations come in and come out, that sometimes it changes what um, the priorities are based on the need. Uh, we work closely with our strategic planning um, team as well as the county planners to anticipate um, new development, um, plans of development and things of that nature so that as we're developing the capital plan, it is um, in line with where the seats and the needs are related to our students. So that's part of the plan we do. 
think Russ Brown has something he'd like to add to it as well. Yeah, and in particular to, to that uh, project, um, with the upcoming enrollment projections, which we'll receive in January, um, we can resolve that without an addition. So, so again, we're not going to get the information about the priorities having shifted until after we're supposed to vote on the capital, county capital request. So, again, not really making good informed decisions. Um, to dovetail with uh, Mr. McDaniels on the question of are we spending enough on maintenance, um, I had the opportunity to attend the IAC, the Interagency Committee for School Construction, and there was a committee member that asked um, Mr. Dixit, I believe it was you, uh, for an update on how many vacancies are in the BCPS Maintenance and Operations Department. Um, so I'm wondering, was that information provided to the IAC yet? And when it is provided, can uh, the board please receive that same update? The information will be provided to IAC and we'll work with the superintendent to provide that information to wherever it's needed. And just as a point of clarity, um, I, I think that the, the question that they were asking related to state vacancies, and we tried to clarify it at the time. So what we're, what I think they were asking us for is the total number of grounds and facilities employees. So the question that was asked were, were not our employees, they were state inspectors and employees. So we, we, we tried to work that through with them after the discussion because the question they asked didn't necessarily apply to us. But what we did hear from that was they wanted to know the total number of facilities and grounds personnel that we had. Is that for future projects? Excuse me? For future projects? For the, future projects or is that for? They, they wanted to know the total number of personnel that we had to, to manage our uh, large infrastructure. And they started the conversation with the vacancies in the state maintenance inspection section. That's not that's us. For, that's not us. Yes, they, they did make that statement that there are vacancies in the state, but they also wanted to understand within Baltimore County Public Schools, were there vacancies in the maintenance department, and if so, how many? Because one of the members' points was that it seemed that there was a lot of deferred maintenance that then resulted in a greater amount of capital requests in terms of replacing full systems that if they had been maintained better. And this, again, is not a, a, a criticism of you or your department, because you can only do the best you can with the dollars that you're given. And I uh, have understood in the past you've requested a certain amount to be in the maintenance budget and you didn't get all that you've requested. So I would certainly be one that would support maintenance and facility getting their full recommend recommended need because a stitch in time does save nine and if we do continue with consistent upkeep, it can help us out in the long run. Very good. Ms. Causey, I'm going to ask others to ask questions uh, as we have others here and we have a uh, fair amount of time uh, dedicated to this already. Mr. Vert. Well, I would add, uh, um, uh, as Kurt Schmoke once said, by the inch it's a cinch, by the mile it <laughs> takes a while. Um, I just wanted to just share three points with you. The first is in regard to Perryall Middle School, uh, I was there for a uh, back to school night and uh, one of the vice principals there, there's four of them, but one of them, uh, Ms. Duncan, asked me to come back uh, during a class change. Uh, maybe stand at what, what's referred to as sort of Grand Central Station. It's out where, where like the lockers are and to watch uh, the classes change. Now they've did some shifting around with, you know, up staircases and down staircases and things kind of move along. But there's a lot of kids there, but it's the craziest thing. Parents say, you know, there's a great staff here. I feel good that my child is getting a really, really good education, but there's just too many kids at the school. And a lot of folks want their children to go there because it is such a good school. And it's good to hear again that there are options under consideration. And as we've heard it at this day us more than once, these decisions really are made somewhere else. Decisions about building additions, decisions about building new schools, those are, those are made at, at the old county courthouse. And they're made by elected officials, local officials, uh, county executive. There's participation by, in, in some means, I suspect, by the county council. Our state elected officials fund things, and our statewide elected officials play a role. Our state senators and our delegates do. Um, we get to go along in many ways, and we become a place where people come and talk to us, and we gather a lot of information uh, about Perry Old Middle School. I was there last week, 
and I uh, stood at Grand Central Station. I saw the class change. I was with Lisa Perry, and I was talking to her about a recent roof repair that y'all did. Two comments. The first is, she's very pleased with how y'all respond when, when a request for service is put in. She was a, she very pleasantly pleased with the quality of the response time. Secondly, you recently did a roof repair there. It rained. Your team followed up to find out if the repair was still holding. That is extraordinarily well received by folks who've had a repair done, just to make sure it's working. And that was echoed by Charlene Benke at Vincent Farm Elementary School when I was there last month for American Education Week. Roof repair, and you all followed. I had somebody come out and actually look at the thing. So really, there are things that you do, and you do extraordinarily well. Secondly, uh, Pleasant Plains Elementary School on Friday, we had like 17 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Um, there were about, a, you know, there were six classrooms that uh, the temperature, uh, there wasn't heat in them. And the students were relocated. That was the procedure, relocate them to heated areas. And um, you had folks out working on those six classrooms. Um, the zone superintendent uh, took my call. Uh, followed up herself on Friday. Fridays are particularly difficult to get anything done. People take Fridays off. But uh, you had folks out there working. And then on Monday, and of course over the weekend, and then on Monday, uh, there were three other classrooms that went out, but you had folks there as well. The students were looked out for. And students weren't in uh, onerous temperatures, temperatures that they shouldn't be in. Um, I know it's an ongoing matter because of the vintage schools. And I can think of three that we're going to be talking about tonight. They're middle schools, and they serve our 6th district, I'm pleased to point out. One of them was built in 1931. That's Golden Ring Middle School. Another is a school I attended. Tells you how old it is. It opened in 1949, although I was not even a glean in my parents' eyes. And the third one, Middle River Middle School, 1958. We have three air conditioning projects that, if possible, will include some additional systemic work for those schools. And that's one of the differences between our jurisdiction and some other jurisdictions that took um, a different route to cool their schools. When those schools were done, it was de minimis, meaning as little as possible to get some cooling temperatures in. When we do it, we often piggyback with additional systemic improvements, upgrading electricity, other matters, a roof repair if possible, et cetera, a kitchen upgrade, for example. So that distinguishes us from other jurisdictions. I really want to give, you know, a special thanks to the job you do. 25,000 requests for service. That's a heck of a large number of responses. Steve, that's about 80 per day, 365 days a year. Figure it out. Our Ford CPA. <laughs> so um, I, I do want to compliment you on, on the fine work you do. I know whenever I've inquired, you all have taken the time to not just respond, but also to answer some of my inane lawyer-like questions and have been very, very patient. You know, you own a house, there's always something going on. Expansion, contraction, this breaks, that has to be repaired. It's an ongoing effort. I know I appreciate it, and I also appreciate the fact that not just y'all, but your, you know, the central office staff will also coordinate and follow up with this board member. And our 6th district certainly appreciates it. So uh, I see Ms. Eaton had her hand up, and then I'll ask if there's any other board members who have not yet had a chance to ask questions, to ask questions. Ms. Eaton. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the um, schools that are overcrowded. I know that the fire department comes either two, three times a year to check the alarm system and see how fast the students evacuate the school. Do you know if there's any t um, time that these overcrowded schools did not evacuate in a timely manner because they were so overcrowded? Um. I don't think we have any reports as of this year or last year, but um, we'll, we can get that specific number if, if, if they do. But I don't think that we have any because they normally get discussed in our safety briefings. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yulfeder. Um, I just wanted to step back for a minute, not talk about any specific school, but I wanted to follow up on what Mr. Birch said. You know, and I've said this before and I criticize sometimes, the general public, and I'm sure plenty of our board members, don't understand the enormity of our system. I would ask you, if you really want to understand it, go visit all 200 facilities. See how long it takes you. See what, you're, see what it, it's all about. And the other thing is, 
Um, as I said, if you take the 25,000 divided by 365, you're talking about uh, roughly 80 requests a day. That's pretty significant. And the other thing I want to caution people, in the use of state-rated capacity at overcrowding, uh, to my knowledge, we don't have any schools where every kid doesn't have a seat. State-rated capacity is a complicated formula based on square footage uh, available for X amount of students. So I just caution you, when we're using it, it's being misused by the public as well as some of the board members. So be careful uh, when you say state-rated capacity and what it means. It does not mean seat per, 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 per student. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Your presentation this evening it's been very informative um, two of my fellow board members have brought up Perry Hall Middle as a specific case where the overcrowding has presented challenges I think that tells you something and I'm going to be the third that raises it um, my daughter is a student at Perry Hall Middle so I have a personal interest as well as professional in that matter mm -hmm. the building is very well maintained um, it's impeccably maintained so congratulations for, for that and kudos to the staff for maintaining it However, I would like to see follow-up regarding the safety concerns that Ms. Miller and um, fellow citizens have raised, um, fire safety being one, particularly in common areas. Um, the cafeteria, I've been in the cafeteria, it can be a scary place to, to go through. Um, so I would appreciate some follow-up regarding that. Let me do that. Thank you very much. Yes. And Ms. Hen, just along those lines, again, we will be looking at the middle school seats for um, 2019 and FY19. Uh, so I just wanted to reassure you of that. And then, Mr. McDaniels, back to your, um, your question as well. For the FY18 budget, I know that the superintendent will be looking at facilities and maintenance uh, under managing growth under the uh, FY18 budget. Ms. Miller, I know you have your hand up again, but uh, we've all had an opportunity to ask questions once, and we'll have plenty of opportunities to talk about facilities in the future. So if anyone around the table has not yet had an opportunity to ask questions, uh, let's uh, do that. Otherwise, I, I think it's time to move, for us to move on to our next agenda item. This is a, an important issue. You know, facilities is one of our biggest issues. It is. This is the time to ask questions. I've got a couple more questions that I'd like an opportunity to ask. It's uh, almost 8 o'clock, and we've done uh, 45 minutes or more on this agenda item already. One more question would be great. Thanks. I will ask about um, the issue of uh, the, the theft that we had out of the portable classroom at Deep Creek Elementary. Um, can you talk a bit about security of in our portables? And let me just point out that overcrowding really is a safety issue, and this is really another result of overcrowding. Um, I don't necessarily know all the specifics of that particular one, but um, we, we have uh, safety audits that take place at every school, every single school, every single year, and we work closely with the community soups, the executive directors, and the principals of those schools to make sure that we have, um, we can address as uh, the safety challenges and concerns that they have. Um, not necessarily speaking specifically to that particular one there, um, we can certainly look into that and find out uh, the particulars and, and get back with you on that one. But, but generally speaking, I mean, I, I think we, that we this don't have any out. relocatables that are unsecure. I mean, um, that, that it has assets of the school district, it has assets of the taxpayers, so we have to secure all of our facilities. However, um, with any structure there, uh, if there's unfortunately if the will is away, and we have to try to find a way to prevent um, nefarious activities, but sometimes that doesn't always work, and these things happen. Um, we have a process as how we report that through um, the Baltimore County the Police Department, as well as our protocols um, related to reporting it for facilities and safety and security to address those, so that we can support the schools uh, in their in their um, maintaining of their resources there. And in this case, there were 20 laptops. Stolen. Are we going to be looking at maybe not um, storing 
you know, assets like that that could be targets uh, in our portables? Well, we, we don't necessarily tonight want to make that decision for the principal. We want to, the, we want to work with the principal to support them in what's the best decision for their school, and we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do to support that from a technology standpoint and a facility. So I don't want to necessarily speak for the principal, but we're going to do whatever we can to support he or her in their efforts there to, to maintain the resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, we appreciate the update on facilities. We look forward to having opportunities in the future to uh, continue to both ask questions and to uh, learn more. Our next item on our agenda is uh, item H, contract awards, and I ask our contracts chair, Mr. McDaniels, to proceed. Thank you, Mr. McGillis. Uh, members of the board, the board's building and contract committee met earlier this evening, and we discussed items H1 through H6. Uh, we did not get through seven, eight, nine, and we decided to discuss those as a uh, complete board. Uh, items H2 through H6 are coming forward with a recommendation for approval from the co contract committee. We did discuss item H1, but it was voted not to approve for recommendation by a vote of two against and one for. Very good. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Do I have a motion to approve items H2 through H6? So, so moved. All right, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'm abstaining from number three. All right, there's one abstention from H3. H2 through H6 uh, are approved. Let's go to H1. Mr. McDaniels? Yes, that is um, a contract modification and extension for online student courses. And um, two of the committee members expressed some concern about approving it. So uh, I would ask. Uh, Very good. Who, um, Causey and Ms. Hen to speak on. Ms. Causey and Ms. Hen, do one of you want to speak to H1, which is uh, um, online student courses? Sure, I'll speak to that. Some of the questions that I've. I think you need a second on this because it didn't come from the committee. All right. Very good. Thank you, Fred. There is, there is a motion. We need a second. Second. There's a second. All right, now discussion on H1. Thank you, Please. Mr. Chairman. Ms. So Hen. some concerns that were raised in committee um, were regards to the selection of the providers on this contract. Um, we questioned whether other options for acquiring the content had been considered, specifically open educational resources, which would come at no cost to the taxpayer. Um, those options did not seem to have been adequately um, pursued to the committee's satisfaction resulting in our recommendation not to approve this contract. All right. Mr. Uh, McDaniels. And Mr. Gillis, I would just like to add that uh, these are services that are currently being provided students uh, in terms of their ability to keep up when they've fallen behind. Um, I have a lot of concerns about taking away any kind of educational support services that we've already offered to our students, and uh, I am in strong favor of supporting uh, this contract because, again, uh, I think it affects our, our students' ability to graduate on time and not fall further behind their other classmates. Very good. Mr. Virch. Uh, I have two questions, Mr. Chairman. The, question, uh, the first is that the um, opportunities that are available through here, um, these contractors would be subject to our confidentiality and privacy requirements. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, but I think Mr. Imbriali might be able to uh, address those in, in greater detail. Hi, Mr. Birch. So the quick answer is, is that is correct. Um, Good. So I have a second question. Yep. Stop with your head. <laughs> second question is this. <laughs> Open Educational Resources, uh, and I apologize for not being as uh, familiar. Uh, that's one of the benefits of having a committee system and having the benefit of the committee members to, to you know, point you in the right direction and, and give you a heads up. These Open Educational Resources, what, if any, limitations or controls are there on our students' privacy? Uh, with, with OER content, Correct. there typically is none. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Other comments? Ms. Causey? Yes. Um, routinely, I submit questions uh, in advance of the committee meeting and request that uh, where reasonable written answers are provided at the meeting. To date, the uh, 
chair has not supported, uh, facilitated my request in that regard. So we do go over quite a bit of information verbally in a short amount of time. So in this particular instance, I had concerns about the number of students using the SPARC, which is the credit recovery um, in-school program. It also allows for advancement, but it is vast majority is for credit recovery. And my question, which was not completely answered, is why such a vast increase in the uh, annual expenditure, which is going to uh, Apex Learning? Uh, correct me at any point along the way, Mr. Imbriali. Uh, where fiscal year 15 16, 3,927 students took advantage of uh, credit recovery um, or advancement. And then fiscal year 16 17, we're at 7,064. So, my question that really wasn't fully answered was in regard to it, why is it that there's more students? that are unable to uh, master the content in a, the traditional classroom, um, that we should need to in increase uh, for this digital curriculum. So um, as I mentioned during the contract meeting, the, the model of delivery has changed. So prior to the 14-15 school year, uh, the two ways that you could obtain credit recovery were to repeat the course start to finish in an entire school year or go to summer school. You also had evening school as an option at that time. The model has changed since, two, uh, since the beginning of 2014-15, and we've transitioned all of our programs through this school year to ensure that um, we continue to provide options for our students to advance credit or to do credit recovery through multiple avenues. That includes our extended day program, our extended year program, and SPARC, which is in all of our schools. So these numbers are a reflection connected to the online content and online courses are a reflection of how we've increased the program access for all of our students to obtain the credit in a timely manner and walk across the stage. Okay, so how many, how many students were involved in those other programs, summer school, extended year, well, that's what you're calling summer school now, it's extended year, uh, the evening courses in year 1415? I would have to get that data for you. I don't, I don't have all the data about our summer programs or evening programs. Okay, so again. Prior to that day. So again, it, it, it doesn't answer the question of why more students would need access. It, well, they, it, it, says, it indicates that they're not, not getting the, the instruction in the traditional classroom setting. So Ms. Kwasi, I think I can maybe shed some light on this as well. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we have the same number of students pretty much who are needing to recover credit that we've had in the past. We have additional opportunities for students who need uh, not only to recover credit, but who need to have these online courses available to them. So for instance, students who are requesting accelerated courses um, for um, to accelerate their progress and accelerate toward <coughs> graduation, students who are taking advantage of e e-learning opportunities, students who are involved in home and hospital, um, who may be out for whatever reason, and they are also accessing courses. So there are multiple reasons why students um, have to recover, not only recover credit, but who wish to pursue, pursue these courses online. Um, not approving, again, I just want to make sure that the board is fully aware that these are expanded options for our students, and not approving a contract like this really kind of takes away their options and could significantly impact our graduation rate. We just had students just this week who completed their coursework um, at Milford Middle, Middle Academy. Yeah. Uh, instead of taking mm -hmm. the entire course over, they're taking the components that are relevant mm -hmm. to them through this type of offering so that they are able to then graduate on time. Ms. Johnson and then Ms. Williams. Thank you. So for me, the question isn't why right now in this contract, because we have student, we obviously have 7,064 students that need this. So the why might come to the curriculum committee through something else, through additional um, funding for enrichment or um, additional learning f ways that children, students can learn within the classroom. But if we pull this contract, we don't approve this contract, that again is 7,064 students who will not get the SPARC program, extended uh, day learning, extended year learning, and e-learning. 
Um, additionally, the curriculum committee did consider, we vetted this, we, we had d uh, deep discussion about this. It was moved and it had been recommended by the curriculum committee as well. So I have grave concerns about not moving this uh, contract forward because that stops the learning, could potentially stop the learning of all these students that do need it. Ms. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say I've attended all of the summer school um, graduations that we've had since uh, its inception under Dr. Dance. Last year, I had an opportunity to talk to some of the principals, and they could not speak highly enough of the um, opportunities that students um, received from programs like this that allowed their their children, their kids, um, to succeed and to to graduate. So personally, um, I think to not approve this contract would be very detrimental. Mr. Imbriali, this isn't anything new. This is just a continuation of online courses that have been offered and utilized over the years, correct? That's a, that, that is correct. This is a modification and an extension because of the success of the program. <coughs> we're, we're continuing to service more students through this model. Very good. Is there anybody that hasn't had a chance to ask a question that wants to? If not, I think there's been a motion. Has there been, was, I think I got a second. Did I get a motion to? Yes. Okay, I had a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of, uh, of approving uh, this online student courses contract H1, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. There are two opposed, Ms. Hen and Ms. Causey. Uh, now, Mr. McDaniels, you said you went through? One through six. One H through six. six. So we have H7. Mr. Saris, will you please present H7? Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Okay. Dixit started that, so I'll ask All him right. to Mr. Dixit, will you continue? Go yes. to the beginning. May I, may, may I start my presentation? Please. Uh, those of you who have been on the board for some time are familiar with the phase one of the energy performance contracting that was successfully completed for 28 schools a couple of years ago. Since then, we have independently verified the savings that was achieved from that phase one, and the savings is more than what was uh, approved as part of the contract. Uh, those of you who have just joined the board, just to quickly sh say what the performance contracting is, it's a, it's a performance-based tool where, um, uh, uh, which, which allows the BCPS to leverage the fund from the savings achieved by implementing certain capital projects. And from the savings, we raise funds, and the funds are raised by the company that we have contract with. The company borrows funds for implementation of those projects and guarantees the saving that will meet the payment. In the event that savings is not achieved, the private company, the vendor, pays for the difference. So this is the second phase of the contract, which will include uh, 74 schools. The savings will come from 74 schools. This is in the eastern half of the county. And the energy improvements, which will include lighting upgrades, which will include control upgrades, and by control upgrades, we'll have better learning environment in the classroom in those 37 schools. And we'll also include air conditioning of three middle schools. We learned from the last experience that installation of air conditioning was expedited by putting them under the performance-based <laughs> contracting. Not only that, one of the three schools, Stemmers Run, will be from the package that will be privately financed. So in nutshell, there will be energy improvements in 37 schools. There will be air conditioning at three schools. Two schools, the air conditioning will be from capital funds, and one school, Stemmers Run, will be from the financed package. And this will allow us to complete the air conditioning um, by next school opening at these three locations. Very so good. I'm requesting your board approval for this Very so good. that we can start with the business of implementing these projects. Very good. Before we ask any questions, I'd like a motion to approve H7. So moved. Is there a second? Yes. There's a motion and a second. Now discussion. Any questions? Seeing none. Uh, Ms. Ms. Miller. I sat in on the contracts committee, but I I find this very convoluted, and you might have to explain it a little 
better for me. So this is a $60 million contract, which it will take us, tw is it 22 years to recoup Correct. the money, And to complete the construction of yeah. all the projects. And how much, uh, you talked about cost energy savings. How much is the cost avoidance savings per year on this? Um, let's see if I have an annual number, do you? Uh, tip, for example, in phase uh, one, the projected savings were about um, 2.2 million and we saved approximately 2.6 million. Um, and I'm not sure I have an annualized number um, unless uh, the folks from Noresco have that. But what I can say is that savings is enough to make the payment on that loan. So there'll be no county money or school system money that will go towards the payment of that loan. Right. The budget does, our current budget does not increase as a result of this project. The, and, and I'm not sure if I understood Ms. Causey's question earlier, but our current utility budget uh, will be sufficient with the cost avoidance to fund this project all the facility improvements and and want the stemmers run air conditioning improvement and then as we did also in phase one the other two projects will be funded with our regular state and county capital budget and by doing it this way uh, the contractor uh, takes over the management the expediting of the project and allows us to focus on projects that we're uh, bidding directly ourselves and managing. There, stop there, and, and Mr. Dixiter, I think, may be the better one to answer. This is uh, a, a second hunk of schools, That's and we've right. already approved and are underway with a first hunk of That's schools. Right. And we'll be coming back to tell you us for the, the remind, third hunk. remind the board about phase one, as you call it. The phase one was a $28 million project. It had 29 schools as part of that project, and there was a savings of about $2.4 million per year that paid towards that $28 million. And that has been in effect for two years now, and the savings have been independently verified, and they are more than what was included in the contract. But well, we're paying principal and interest. I mean, this is a loan. so it's. This is a loan taken Over by the vendor, years. not from us. The, the loan is taken by Noresco in this case. In the previous case, the loan was taken by Johnson Control, <laughs> not by us. But the interest is built into yeah. our in, cost. Inter but, the, but the interest is paid from the savings, from the cost avoidance of the utilities. And by doing all of this, we are improving building. It's, it's an alternate way of making capital improvements to the building, and in this case, providing air conditioning to the building in the right way. So we're two years into phase one, and now this is phase two? This is separate group of schools, yes. This and is, is there going to be another group yes. following this? The, the other this? group will be for the west half of the county. This is for the east half of the county. The next group will be for the west half of the county. So there'll be three phases. That's right. Ms. Causey. To dovetail on Ms. Miller's questions. With the phase one that was uh, done under Johnson Controls, how many years was that contract? That was about 20 years. 20 years? Yes. It's 18 or 20 years. It's some, somewhere in that range. So we're still in the midst of that? Yes. Okay. So when you're talking about improvements to schools that will be done, that's still future no, the improvements have already been made. So under the Johnson Controls Phase 1, all the improvements that were going to be made have already been made? They were ahead of schedule. They were supposed to be made in 14 months, and they were completed in 12 months. That's wonderful. Um, then with this Phase 2, when are all of these uh, capital improvements to the 74 schools supposed to be done? 
it's, uh, the air conditioning will be done by August of this year, it's 2017. All three middle schools will be air conditioned by August of 2017. And all of the other capital work needed in the building will be done over next 24 months. And these are target dates. Some of it will be sooner than this. Some of it may take a little longer. Mr. S Mr. Dixit, without this uh, contract's approval, uh, the three middle schools will not be air conditioned? We'll not be able to start air conditioning. We'll definitely not be able to meet the timeline that we have indicated so far. Other questions? Ms. Jones? That was my question. Thank you. Mr. Yulfader. I think we're missing on the fact that the contractor is guaranteeing uh, the money uh, if, in fact, the savings is not uh, sustained over this 22-year period. So really, uh, this is an item that doesn't get booked because the debt is not our debt. And um, I, I, it's a, it's a no-brainer to me as long as it's being guaranteed. Our, our funds are not at risk. So I can't find any reason why we wouldn't want, not want to go. I mean, I can't find one reason that I've heard why not to go ahead with this project. Mr. Birch. These are the three schools I uh, foreshadowed just minutes earlier. Uh, and they are the Vinted schools, and they are serving our 6th district in addition to our 7th district, and they are all of our students. Uh, I would urge the board to speedily approve this contract. Other questions? If not, Ms. Miller. I'm very bothered by the fact that we it, it, we don't get a lot of information, and this is done two hours before our meeting. This is a huge contract, $60 million. I just feel like we, we never get enough information here in a timely manner where we could actually consider things. Other questions? Ms. Causey. What is the interest rate? Uh, the interest rate will be in the range of about 5.1 to 5.4 percent and um, we the vendor will uh, has taken competitive bids and they will uh, within the next week lock in a rate we're hoping that it'll actually be at the low low end closer to the 5.1 percent or perhaps lower uh, interest rates have moved a lot in the past 60 days uh, they went dramatically up and they've scaled back a little recently so you're saying that Noresco is going to run the project. So our our internal teams are not going to be running these projects. Are we going to We're get a contract in front of the inspecting board? Inspecting them. We have a project manager that will be working closely with Noresco. In case of air conditioning, designs have been completed by our consultants. Okay. Well, I, I just have to uh, agree with Ms. Miller that a lot of this information, if it was simply given to us in writing in advance, it would clear up all this. Our meetings could be more efficient and run on time. And it is simply a matter of leadership that does not want information to be put out ahead of time. And, and as Mr. Ufelder is saying, it seems like it's a no-brainer, but it would really be nice to actually know that ahead of time. All right. Uh, call for the vote now on uh, item H. Seven. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are two Same. opposed, um, Ms. Hen and Ms. Causey, and Ms. Miller abs abstains. Um, the next contract is H8. Mr. Dixit. Eight, H8 is a good news story for the board. Uh, as you have heard several times, that there have been capacity issues at Padonia Elementary School. Padonia International Elementary School. Um, this project provides for addition of eight classrooms and changes to the gym area to provide additional number of classrooms. We had included several ad alternates because we were not sure whether we'll be able to complete all of the work. I'm very pleased to share that the lowest bid, and there are lots of bids here, there's about six bids, I believe, um, and we had f five alternates, all of the ad alternates uh, and the lowest bid, they were all within the budgeted amount, so we are going to recommend your approval 
to accept the lowest bid in the amount of uh, $5.267 million, no, $5.178 million plus a contingency. So the contract is totaled $5.696 million, and it'll have eight new classrooms and addi additional add alternates for site work. Is there a motion to approve H8? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Causey. So Mr. Dixit, thank you very much for your work on this project. Uh, so does that mean at the end of the construction, all of the relocatable classrooms will be removed? Is the eight classrooms going to be sufficient? That's our expectation, yes. Okay, so this is the plan that was presented to the community that the yes. one that they were hoping. And this is the plan that school administration and community wanted. And from what I've been told, they're very pleased with it. Okay, thank you very much. So, so when it says add all two, three, four, and five, one is the base contract. One was for two classroom addition. In the event bids were high, we would not be able to take four were in the base bid, and then there was an add alternate for two addition, in addition to four base bid, and the second one is for four additional in addition to four b base bid. So. I see. So if since we, did, if we got the bids to be higher than budget, we would go with the first one, which will only give six classrooms. But this one got the whole thing. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Uh, mine is just a comment. I want to thank Pedonia Elementary School, the parents, the administrators there. Um, I attended the school multiple times. The, your, your advocacy uh, for the school, for the community, is absolutely astounding and inspirational. And the school itself, if people haven't visited that school, it's just a, it's a great environment that you don't see. Uh, any, there's nothing like it throughout the county. So thank you and congratulations, Pedonia. Any other questions on H8? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? H8 passes. Uh, the last contract. First, we get a round of applause. Uh, H9, uh, Mr. Dixit. The final contract for tonight is for installation of air conditioning at Ricestown Elementary School. The project will require central air conditioning system and electrical upgrade. Uh, the, the bids are within the budgeted amount, uh, and the contractor. Uh, is a reputable contractor. We are recommending your approval, and this will be the last elementary school that we'll be coming to you for. Uh, is there a motion to approve H9? So moved. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Johnson. I just have to make a comment for Reisterstown. Um, I have visited that school as well, and as Ms. Causey and I have mentioned before, they're they are working out of closets and, and utility rooms. Um, so I am looking forward to further discussion with the county to do, um, to expand that school, to create some more seats, to make it a safe and uh, equitable learning environment for our students. And, um, you know, I also had the same questions about why Fort Garrison needs an addition. I've had the explanation. I don't know that they need an addition, even with the explanation that's been provided to me. So I hope that the county continues to look further into that so Reisters can get the school that they need. All right, uh, Ms. Causey. Um, I would like to make a motion to add an agenda item to the uh, first meeting in February, unless that's the operating budget approval. I don't know, but we have a, we have a motion now on Okay, I'd like to H, add. On, we have a motion on H9. You want to amend H9? Yes, I do. All right, what's your amendment? I want to amend H9, approval of that contract, with adding an agenda item to the second meeting in February, where staff will bring forward uh, analysis of the plumbing and also uh, discussions of why it was taken off of the Schools for a Future 2014 as a replacement and how we're going to address the overcrowding uh, by looking at an addition or other options for that. I'd like that to be an agenda item. All right, I don't think that you intend to interfere with the award of this air conditioning contract. If you do, um, by making that motion and waiting till February, you're, you're throwing the brakes on, on no, the, the, the... I'm saying you're throwing the brakes on the contract award, um, and I'm not, you know, you'd have to have a second on your motion to amend. But if all you're asking is to have an agenda item, let's first vote on H9, and then you can make a motion to add, to place something on the agenda. 
uh, adding agenda items is not as easy as you're making it sound. So I would, I have my motion on the floor. It'll All right, be is there a second? Well, All right, any order, this is this is about this specific contract. Correct. Now, in theory, if we go along with what my colleagues suggest, we'd then be making motions about anything. I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure I'm with that you. it's within the realm of I could ask the parliamentarian if that, if that motion is out of order. I mean, the problem is it's not, it's not, it's not totally relevant. It seems to me, at least, it's not relevant really to the, to the uh, issue that's on the agenda as far as the approval of the contract. What's relevant is the fact that school facility priorities change constantly, and not only does this board not take the initiative to discuss why that happens, we don't, we are not involved at all. And this board votes by law for a reason, and it's because we are supposed to be setting the priorities, checking on the allocation of funds, that it's equitably distributed, that there's common sense reasons that it's distributed and that it is in fact the most effective use of the taxpayer dollars for the benefit of our students. Right. So, so it, it is relevant because this school has been taken off of getting a replacement school. They're being given central air conditioning and that's going to uh, make it harder for them to get state funding later on. So all I'm asking for is the agenda item for this board to discuss options to try and actually help this school. So if the, if the motion if the parliamentarian says the motion is not out of order, we'll vote on the motion to amend. I would, and I'm not sure whether you intend for this to halt the contract until February. I do February. not intend for it to halt the contract. Ms. Miller. I'd just like to say that uh, when certain board members can't get items on the agenda, we have results like this. We have to go another route to get things discussed. So it might look convoluted, but if this is the way we have to operate, this is what we have to do. So maybe we should all take this as a learning opportunity. Are any more discussion on the motion to amend? All in favor of the motion to amend, please say aye. 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 There's three. Opposed? Please say no. no. Nay. All right, we're going to... I, I need I need the nose to raise their hand. Oh no, the, we needed seven to we needed seven for the motion to amend. To, it fails. Um, okay, we're back to the um, original motion on H nine. Any further discussion? I'm just going to say ahead of time that I'm going to vote no on this contract, not because Reisterstown Elementary School shouldn't have air conditioning. They absolutely should. And as Marisol has mentioned, I have been there to visit and understand the needs of that school and that community, and I support it. But I am going to vote no because this board needs to do more to help that school and the other schools. Okay. All in favor of, um, of H9, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. No. There's one no. Any any abstain? The, uh, the contract H9 passes. Next item on our agenda is item I, and I think Mr. Sayers and Mr. Dixit are probably going to stay right there. Um, and it is um, the uh, report on the FY18 county capital budget. And Mr. Smith. Please. Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, uh, Ms. White, and members of the board, uh, we're bringing to you tonight the capital, the, the county capital request that um, is being presented tonight. There's been a lot of discussion with the facilities update as well as with the um, um, building and contract, contracts that are coming forward. Um, I, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Dixon, who's going to uh, go through the um, local uh, request for our state request that has come forward today uh, for FY18. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Smith. In the meeting of September 13, 2016, board approved the state capital budget. Today's uh, uh, approval is for the county portion of that cap capital budget. The exhibit in front of you shows that all of the projects that you had approved for state capital budget, county has agreed to fund the local share of that capital budget. In addition to that, um, that the, the 
the approval that county has given are all air conditioning projects, high school renovation projects, <coughs> and construction of elementary schools. In addition to these projects, the county has also provided funds to complete a backlog of projects that could not be funded due to competing priorities. So because of the efforts that Superintendent and Mr. Smith has made with county folks, county has finally realized some of the discussion that we had in the earlier part of this meeting, that there is a backlog of other projects, that there is a world beyond air conditioning and new schools. And so in order to meet those needs, you will see that county has allocated funds for some of the fuel tank replacement, uh, ADA improvements, kitchen equipment um, upgrade, transportation improvements, roof and site improvements. We have an ongoing backlog of these projects and these funds are very much needed to meet those needs. And so the action today is your approval of the county portion of the budget. So and that's not quite right. We're going to vote on this on January 10, yeah. 2017, our first January meeting. So this is a presentation regarding that. Um, if you're any other comments from the table? If not, I'll open up the, the floor for questions. Ms. Williams. Yes, I'd like to know, is it possible for us to, us meaning the board, to receive notice of a change in your priorities? in terms of if something is going to be constructed or renovated or air conditioning and it's changed after it's been shared with us. What's the process in place and how can you ensure the board that we will be notified ahead of time when, when possible? I mean, I understand sometimes things happen and it's, it's fluid. It, it, you know, you may not be able to, you know, necessarily immediately get to, you know, notify us. But there ought to be a, some process in place where we are informed. I'll handle the first part and then you can start on that. The, the request in front of you today does not have any change in priority. Good. This does not change any of the priority that you haven't already approved. Great. In the event we change your approved item, we'll come back to you and we'll share with you the change in priority. And, and some of those priorities m m may be a factor of where seats are needed or if there are items that are um, become pressing because of v various demands. Uh, I think one that has been discussed earlier today was Perry Hall. It's not on the capital request now, but it's not to say that that couldn't come based on uh, 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 something that needed to be moved further up. With that, we will try to make sure that our priority list does not, won't be tampered or uh, encumbered much, but it could by another project. However, the 18 requests that we have now has gone through the, the various processes that we have to go through now other than getting your approval at the net, at the January 10th meeting and we'll move forward with it. But if any additional items that will come forward, it has to come to the board for approval um, in order to move it forward. So you're saying then you're not making changes once we've approved something without bringing it back to us? That is correct. No, your funding has been approved. So your funding has been approved. There has not been any change in, in but, priority. That is correct. There are items that are on the capital plan that may be in out years that make it, may, we may relook at, but when the funding is approved for this one, we had a lot of forward funding that really solidified this particular capital plan. Okay, so, but prior to funding then, do you, what's the process for coming back to us to let, it, to let us know? It would be through in the capital, the, the capital budget process. So there's a series of, of, um, public hearings as well as input from um, various stakeholder groups, area advisory committees and things of that nature. So would there be a situation where something changes and we don't find out until after the fact? I'm talking about the non-funding. Clearly it's an issue. Um, my colleague is raising it and I don't, she's not making it up. So I'm trying to get to an example of where this has happened. The, the example is Reistertown, but it's not an example where it, where that is completely what happened. It was on the capital plan as an out project. 
then as the priorities change related to the need for seats as it relates to the countywide schools for our future, then that item got reevaluated and then it came off. But it That's still has. That's all I'm right there. Was the board notified? It has to come back to the board for approval in order to move forward. Yes. It, it, so it, it has to come back to the board in order to be. So the, the timing difference is, is from the original schools for our future plan, which, like you said, in the out years, things aren't necessarily voted on, but it's on the plan for the future. But that plan is Correct. not approved by the board. That is a county document. Right. We, this is this is a school correct. board. Document. So it's it's a county document, and I and I was going to, to suggest to my colleague um, Ms. Williams that it's the county executive's press releases where we have found out about changes to the county capital's request. Last year it happened. This time last year he had a press conference at two o'clock, and then we had a brand new spreadsheet in front of us. <coughs> is that correct? You can confirm um, that uh, to vote on um, the capital request. So. Um, you know, the, the other uh, point that I was going to make is since I've attended multiple interagency committee meetings for school construction, I have um, learned that even though the board may vote on a uh, state capital request and then the county capital request, that additional plans and designs and documents need to be turned in to the IAC in order to get approval. Correct. So we don't necessarily know which plans have got, have been submitted have been submitted and approved, been submitted and C-listed, B-listed, and so forth. So that might be helpful for us to be getting updates along the way as you're working through that process, because we may vote on a, on a spreadsheet like this one that has things in priority order, but if the plans aren't submitted by the, by the school system, then they're not even going to be considered for funding. So that, you know, that's another area where the board may vote thinking that we have prioritized our needs equitably around the county or based on, you know, the, the greatest need for seats, but then it's not in our control with what actually happens. And I think that we should be getting updates, as Ms. Williams has suggested, too. Uh, Mr. McDaniels. Um, I just wanted to ask for a little clarity. Um, just at Stemmer's run, where we talked about um, funding air conditioning through the Noresco project, and then it's also on the state request. How does how does that work? The the there are two parts to that budget. There is a local share and there is a state share. The local share is the county share. Yes. That will be utilized for other projects. That is a savings for the local support. The state share, Okay. The, the, the entire amount of state share will be used and, the, and the, the local share county would not have to pay for that project. Let me try it one more time. <laughs> if there were $50 from the state and $50 from the county, the $50 of the state will be utilized by getting the state reimbursement. The $50 of the county we will not have to spend and they'll be used to support other project. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think so. <laughs> Other questions, board members? Before Ms. Causey, anybody else? By Ms. Causey. Um, so as part of the uh, county capital request spreadsheet that you have in front of us, you have as a state funding request for fiscal year uh, 2018 as $134,000. And since we were allocated um, only about $50 million for fiscal year 17, we could estimate that we would get around a, a similar amount based on the state's uh, prediction of what they're going to fund. So what happens with the other $85 million that's requested? Does the county plan to fully fund the four high school renovations, the Northeast Elementary School, the Dundalk Elementary School replacement? The current capital plan that you have before you now uh, with the state the current state amount and the local piece, it will be fully funded as presented. So they've, the county has full funded all of the projects that the state has obligated and the ones that are futurely going to be obligated as it relates to the amount that we normally get from an annual basis. So it's been fully funded by the county as it has been in prior years. <coughs> whatever, whatever the state share that does not get funded, the local picks that up. That, that's been a pretty ongoing practice here. The difference with this one is this, 
the county has for funded all of the AC projects in excess of $166 million to make sure that those projects don't get delayed while the various uh, capital cycles from the state are anticipated. Okay, and in terms of the cycles of the state funding, um, what is the current status of the $10 million in state funding that was withheld pending uh, a plan by Baltimore County Public Schools to install air conditioning, whether portable, um, in all unair conditioned classrooms um, in the short term? The, the plan for all of the Baltimore County schools to be air conditioned has been provided. As far as we're concerned, the $10 million is, is coming to us, so I can't tell you what the state's going to do. I just know that we've submitted our plan to finish all of the AC projects to this board, to the IAC, and so what they do with the $10 million, you have to ask them that question. So we, so the system has provided all answers to any questions that the state has given to you? I didn't say that. I said the system has provided a plan for the remaining AC projects that we have to complete all of our AC projects. They, there may be a host of questions that they have that I don't have, but what, what we've done is submitted a plan for how we're going to complete all of the AC projects for the remaining schools that we have in Baltimore County. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, so the, I'm glad to see that some of this backlogged maintenance, deferred maintenance is being taken care of. We are too. Yes. Um, I know that air, central air conditioning in all of our schools is a priority to everybody here um, sitting around the dais as well throughout the county, um, but we have to take care of some of these things. Um, the fact that we, you know, the roof replacements, the fuel tank replacements, um, boilers I'm sure are part of that with the issues that we've had at Pleasant Plains, so thank you for taking care of that. I do have additional questions about how are we going to address um, the possible overcrowding at some of the schools that we have the limited renovations for. So Patapsco High School was represented today. We've heard a lot from Delaney. Is that going to be anywhere in the, this particular plan or in the future? The plan as it, as it states today uh, accounts for the limited renovation that was presented to the each com each of the schools communities as well as the bo the board here related to the feasibility study if that plan changes relative to when the bids come back um, I think the superintendent had indicated that the county executive and the superintendent would go back and discuss if, if another plan needed to be made based on if those bids came in um, at a different um, financial point okay then forgive me does it add seats are we adding seats? No. We are not. Okay, thank you. And then um, lastly, in the presentation you gave earlier, we, uh, it was said that the, the department wants to pr promote and increase community participation. So I know we've got um, the chief communications officer here. I'm hoping that we do have some more either community forums or some, uh, some other way that's besides Facebook posts that, that parents can um, Communicate with the board. I know we have the BOE at bcps.org email address, and feel free to email any of us and or, or the, the the email address directly. But if we could have something in the future um, where our parents, our, our our stakeholders, our community members can actually come out and give their input, their verbal input, because not online communication isn't where everybody wants to be. So if if we are truly passionate about promoting and increasing community participation. I'd like to see something like that in the future. I'll just add this, Ms. Johnson. Um, we work with each school community who has a project on the, on the list. So um, maybe not so much on social media, right. but we, we, we want to work with the principal in the community. I, I don't know if that's going to be what all want to have happen, but we, we, we feel like the best communication comes from the principal, and we support that principal in making sure that that information gets to those various communities. Um, but we can do whatever this board wants us to do, but I, I just wanted to make sure that we don't, we don't utilize social media yet to talk about our capital plan. We, we, we go to the schools and to the, to the communities to try to address that. So I wanted to make sure that there was a distinction there. Yes, and I, I, I think we, we just need to expand going into the communities a little bit. The principals give amazing input, and they are the, the, the owners of the school for the most part. When we walk into the school, it's like coming into their own home, and they're very, they're very proud of it. What I'd also like to see is expanding that, um, even if it's just individual board members, we're creating our own public forums. Um, but having some sort of further involvement so that when we th see things on social media or even out in the community and we're talking to people and it's not true, we can then address that face on, head on with, with fact and not 
um, made up statistics. And I promise you I'm not debating you, but I, I just need for this board and the public to know the process to doing this is long. So when you engage a community, they expect that it's going to happen next month. It doesn't happen that way. We have a long process that we have to go through, which sometimes feels as if we have left the community devoid because we haven't gotten back to them. But what we want to be cautious about is getting back to the community with half of the information. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is we send a community in a, in a uh, we put them in a bad bad way and that's not what we're going to do so I, I totally agree with what you're saying but I just need for the community to bear in mind that this process this state process that we have good bad or indifferent it's a long process and it takes some time so when we engage the community about the high schools we haven't forgotten the high schools but we haven't gotten to that next step that next level yet so um, and we'll do that with the other schools as well so we'll and certainly if this is the board's will we'll, Ms. we'll Smith well, I to, to clarifying to that is I'm sorry. thank you for that and Ms. Johnson to that point as we're engaging folks particularly our schools I think it's important when folks know what's coming right so we talked about the middle school enrollment piece being addressed in the FY19, high school enrollment to be addressed in FY20. So I think it's important that as we're engaging our, our school communities that they know in advance what's coming so that they'll know when to be a part of that conversation as well. Great. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Um, I feel compelled to say it every time it's in front of me that um, I believe that a limited renovation at Lansdowne High is an inadequate travesty and a very expensive waste of taxpayer money. And I'll say it each time. Um, next point, um, the deferred maintenance, does that include um, Woodlawn High School? Is there any plans to complete the, uh, or there was a, apparently a, an AC issue last summer and there was a part ordered but it just hasn't been completed do you know if woodlawn high school um, is that, part of that th those um, we can certainly get you greater detail but the, the the funding that we have here is designed to address a host of problems that we have and not necessarily go through you know a, a long list of this one this one this one. Right. this is backlogs of multiple years that we haven't been able to address. We can look and see if this one is going to be one of the ones, but I don't I don't want to get into going through each individual project right now because that could Okay. But take, if you could let me know, I'd appreciate it. I would, I would it. certainly will. And can you what, I'm sorry, Woodlawn High School? Yes. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about the transportation improvements? What it, does that entail? Um, primarily, it's some of our transportation bus lots. We have 11 lots, and those lots are in v various degrees of um, repair. They need repair and, um, and maintenance to make sure that those lots are um, suitable for our buses to be on, because the same way we have to clear roads and schools for um, for children and parents to come in. We have bus lots that we have drivers that have to come on those lots and we have to make sure they're well, they're well maintained. Some of them need, um, we have to continue our efforts in maintaining those lots as we move along. Thank you. Before Ms. Causey gets the last word, last question, Mr. Uh, I want to know if anyone else has any questions. Mr. I, Uelfelder. I want, to, I want to put a little more in perspective. When I got on the board in 2008, uh, I found out that the first comprehensive maintenance plan was actually formulated in 2002. And the reason for that was that, that the county and the school system for the past 40 years prior to that had really neglected the maintenance of our schools. And today we are paying the price for what was neglected for 40 years. Uh, an, amount, an amazing amount has been done since 2002. Um, and, and I think that, that we, we see the fact of 50-year-old and 40-year-old schools. But that's really the, the, the background, is the fact that there was just a neglect over the past, uh, over those years, and now we pay the price for it. And of course, the, you know, funding has a lot to do with it. Um, I just wanted to bring that up Thanks. so Ms. we all know that. Ms. Causey. Thank you, um, Mr. Gillis. So I did just want to point out, we, we didn't spend any time on it in discussion. We approved the contract for the uh, modification of the demolition of Victory Villa Elementary School. And the reason for that modification was that the project um, consisted of this additional amount of $186,000 in demolition is um, 
consisting of labor and materials that are required to abate additional hazardous material and replace additional unsuitable soils. Both conditions were unforeseen in the original design. They had to uh, utilize a industrial hygienist and then uh, get the architect involved to in the most safe way to take care of the situation. And I would just point out that that was $186,000 modification on top of the $655,000 original contract. So our <coughs> CPA can correct me on the numbers, but that's about a 25% uh, miss, a 25% additional um, need that was unforeseen. And I would just concur with Ms. Miller that in Lansdowne High School that uh, with all of the problems that they have in that school that to try and do a in-place renovation um, when they could just as easily come up with something like this that could increase the cost when you've already started it and as Mr. Ufelder said if you neglect something you're going to end up paying more down the road and that's certainly an issue where I think Lansdowne High School has not been evaluated completely to get a replacement school. Um, and Delaney is in the same case, but for different reasons uh, in terms of their lack of square footage um, and other safety issues that they have at the school. That leads me to my second to last item, which is in the Building and Contracts Committee, I have submitted my fourth request for an update on Lansdowne High School's geotechnical study. In August, the original presentation of schematics to the board indicated that the results of the study were based on only two months of observation, where industry standard is to study the site and the facility for six months, six to nine months. So Mr. Dixit and the engineer said the geotechnical study would continue. So I would hope that the board is going to receive the update on that study, because how can we possibly uh, spend money on an accurate design and then spend money on sending out a bid when we do not have a complete and accurate diagnosis of the settlement problem at that school. So I am requesting that for the fourth time. Uh, also along the lines of um, all of the money that is being spent for the benefit of the students is I have uh, now submitted my fifth request to uh, for staff to provide, and this is really to the superintendent, to allow staff to provide to the board an updated copy copy dash the stat dot XLS spreadsheet which is the BCPS proposed six-year instructional digital conversion plan this is the largest budgetary initiative and the board should have the updated spreadsheet so we have sufficient time to consider it since budget discussions are underway we've talked about increasing maintenance and facility um, budgets we've talked about a whole host of other things and all of this ties in together because many of these things are operating and capital um, budget issues so hopefully the board chair will facilitate my requests and that the board will have these documents in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith, Mr. Sayers, Mr. Dixit. Um, I, just, I just wanted to clear something. First of all, there's a big difference between miss and unforeseen. Uh, if you were around when uh, Carver was demolished, I think that the report was that there were walls that were built in front of walls because the school was built in the 30s. And, and that's unforeseen. They didn't miss it. It was just unforeseen. Thank you. I apologize for that miss, miss word. And, and unforeseen Gentlemen. is exactly the word related to these high school renovations in place. All right. The next item on our agenda is item J, report on policies. And I ask Ms. Williams to proceed. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and Ms. White, and members of the board. The Board of Education's Policy Review Committee has reviewed the policies presented to you for first reader on tonight's board agenda's Exhibit J. The committee is recommending the policies 3150, 3225, 6600, 6601, and 6604 be moved forward for second reader at this time. Staff is available should board members have questions about these policies. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved. All right, there's no need for a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Ms. Miller abstains. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item K, and that is comments from board members. And I'll start with Ms. Eaton. Thank you. During our um, 
comment section, Mr. Weber gave us some numbers on the park test. And I would just like to ask Ms. White if she can double check his numbers and see how accurate they are. And I would also like to see the Buildings and Contracts Committee meeting on a different day and not right before our board meeting so they can have ample time to discuss all their contracts and have all their questions answered so it wouldn't take up so much of our time. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. Ms. Williams. I want to echo um, Ms. Eaton's recommendation and suggestion that we consider uh, changing the, the date and time that um, the Contracts Committee meets. Um, but other than that, I just want to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Causey. I would like to also echo Ms. Eaton's uh, comments. It will be a much more efficient and effective uh, committee if we met on a different day and time and then we're able to communicate more fully to fellow board members and also get any additional information to make a reasonable decision. Um, I do want to say, you know, it's in, it's the middle of the school year, but it is the end of 2016. And while we have made many um, improvements um, to the school system, there are many more issues that we need to work on. Um, for instance, grading and reporting update, I was just last uh, week at a Central Advisory Council meeting where parents are not satisfied. The grading is accurate, consistent, timely. Um, there were some really um, compelling quotes from the parents. Uh, some were, this is horrifying, there is no consistency, this is chaos, it is a game and smart students will learn to work the system while other students suffer. Teachers are coming to school early, leaving late. Lines are around their trailers as students wait for the redo. Um, the teachers are commenting that, that there's still so much work to do that it's taking away from instruction and prep time. Also, it was still not known uh, by the staff which schools are using which grading scales. So I would uh, really appreciate if the curriculum committee could uh, get an update and then from staff and then bring an update to the board, particularly around the high schools where our students are very concerned about how their grades are going to impact their uh, future college plans or their career plans or their plans for the military. Uh, so if we could find out which schools are using the low scale, which is low score, which is 50 to 100 scale, and which are using the 0 to 100. Um, that's also something that parents wanted to know uh, what their students were doing. Also, I wanted to say in the Policy Review Committee, the last meeting, um, the board had in August, when, we, when the board voted to amend Policy 6303, it was sent back to a uh, committee to be worked on, which in my mind meant that it would be improved. However, it was discussed at the open meeting with stakeholders in attendance um, that there were portions of it that they wanted to sunset. So I'm just going to read that here since it was uh, represented. So in Policy 6303, it's being recommended by staff under paragraph 3B that this paragraph is effective until June 30th, 2017, that the board directs the superintendent to close all non-air-conditioned -air schools when the heat index is forecast to reach at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, any time during the following day. This paragraph shall remain in effect until June 30th, 2017. After such time, this paragraph shall be abrogated and have no further force or effect. Then they're going to um, add a paragraph, they're suggesting to add a paragraph on July 1st, 2017. The superintendent may dismiss early non-air conditioned schools when the heat index is forecast to exceed 90 degree Fahrenheit the following day. And then it uh, deletes the other, um, it deletes the paragraph, the, the statement, the superintendent shall have the authority to cancel all school-sponsored activities based on weather conditions. I just wanted to clarify that because from the stakeholders that attended, they uh, did not hear, the, the speakers were not working very well. 
Also, I wanted to say I was disappointed at the Policy Review Committee meeting when I was making suggestions about trying to provide some cooling in the schools that will remain without air conditioning this coming spring, when it is likely that those temperatures will be reached. Um, I had handed out to the committee uh, things that I had uh, gotten off of the internet about commercially available air conditioned rentals that are available. Uh, they routinely use them in hospitals, assisted living facilities, uh, temporary shelters, data centers. Um, but I made a motion to have staff find out um, more about that. But I was outvoted three to one. And so uh, currently there will be no, no studies done, no even general information gathering to how we can have a more effective spring to help prevent uh, heat illnesses for our, especially our elementary school children. So I'm very disappointed in that, and I would hope that um, we can work on that a bit more uh, when we come back next year. Uh, the next PRC meeting is not until February, so we do have some time to uh, think about that. Um, the other thing we'll continue to work on is the facilities issue. And uh, as the gentleman pointed out, our stakeholder, there was actually no discussion of the park scores by the board. The superintendent simply uh, attached a uh, memo to our weekly update. And I do think that we should have a discussion of the park scores at the board meeting. Um, also, I'd just like to say to the community that I understand folks are concerned about the uh, board's governance or lack thereof, lack of oversight, and lack of responsiveness. Um, and uh, the board chair, I would say, is supposed to facilitate the board members in the work that we try to do together for each child, for each school, for each community. But uh, since 2014, it's, this board has been allowing power to consolidate, and that position has become a gatekeeper of information. And I would hope that in the new year, we can work together to get the information that we need to make the best decisions for the students. Um, and in response to the non-responsive board and the community feeling that way, they've organized themselves. That's how the hybrid elected school board bill became a law through num numerous Baltimore County groups testifying in Annapolis, League of Women Voters, ABC Schools, NAACP, Hereford Works, Delaney, Locker Haven Community Association, et cetera. We have numerous hand, uh, Facebook, social media sites, but it would be good if we had, had a way that the board would be involved in getting information from the community directly, and then we could respond directly to clarify any rumors or myths or to acknowledge when we have solved issues uh, for our community. So despite all there is that we can work on to improve the educational experience for our students and teachers, this is the holiday season. And it's a wonderful time to reflect on all of our blessings. Living in Baltimore County in the great state of Maryland in the United States of America offers us incredible freedoms, opportunities, and benefits. So may we all spend time acknowledging and enjoying them. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and wishes for a blessed, healthy, and happy new year. And in the words of the fictional character Tiny Tim in Charles Dickens' classic holiday story, God bless us, everyone. Ms. Buehlfelder. Thank you. Uh, as part of tonight's agenda, there was an item at the end there uh, from the Office of uh, Purchasing Minority and Small Business Enterprise. And I don't know if any of you have taken the time to read it, but I think it's important to know that our purchasing department and BCPS as an entity uh, surpasses the state requirement for minority for MBE participation. And this has happened every year since I've been aboard, and I think that it's, it's just nice to know that, that we are ahead of the rest of the state. We're ahead of what the requirements are in recognizing these organizations. The other thing I want to comment on is I hope over the last week we've all, all had an opportunity to hear all the comments uh, relative to information uh, through all the social networks. Uh, lots of it is not true, so let's not depend on the social networks to provide us our information. Ms. Johnson. Happy holidays. Mr. Virch. Well, I just want to, uh, uh, in, you know, in behalf of um, uh, Lawrence Rudolph, the principal at Golden Ring Middle School, our Golden Ring Middle School, and all those students there and their families and our faculty and our staff, and uh, Brian Thanner, 
at our Stemmers Run Middle School and all of the students there and all their families and all of their faculty and staff and Shannon Porter at our Middle River Middle School and all of the students there and all of the families and all of the faculty and the staff and Lynn Palmer at uh, the principal at Ricerstown Elementary School and all of those um, students and all of those families and all of those faculty and all those staff and Melissa Donata, Don, uh, Don, uh, well you know who I mean, Melissa the principal <laughs> at uh, our Padonia International School and all of those students and all of those families and all of uh, those faculty and staff. I, um, I just want to, you know, express, you know, their their thanks and their appreciation to those board members who who saw the need for this type of improvement to the environment in those schools. And these are not inconsequential. And as I said earlier, this, you know, this board is not financially independent. It is financially dependent. And this is a lot of money that's being spent in these schools. We're very fortunate to be so munificently funded for these specific improvements. I'm very grateful for, for, for this. Uh, perhaps tomorrow I may be at our Perry Hall Middle School because the sixth graders are going to be doing some uh, musical presentations. Um, I'm told by uh, Lynn Perry that the eighth graders have a lot more experience, but I'm, I'm sure uh, you know the sixth graders have every bit as much at heart as the eighth graders. And I hope to be able to be there at 630. And if you're not doing anything, come over to Perry Hall Middle School at 6.30 and hear these sixth graders just, just perform and demonstrate their mastery of the, their musical talent. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Um, as we come to the close of 2016, I do just want to thank and acknowledge all the hard work of the teachers and principals and BCPS staff in trying to make the educational experience of our children better. And to my fellow board members, I would agree, as been stated, we, we can do better. We can, do, we can improve the way we operate and make decisions. And we always need to keep student achievement and just making our students smarter at the forefront of all we do. And I want to wish everybody a very happy holiday season. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. I have two items there, uh, important items. I had expected until this morning that the board would be getting uh, data tonight on the status of AC in our schools, which the board had requested in August. I understand that we'll be getting that report in January, and I hope as this system has had five months to gather this information, and we've been through one fall heat cycle in the meantime, that it will include inside air temperature and other air quality measures. Uh, the other item is uh, we've, uh, we received a news article this week uh, which informed us that there was a breach of student data prior to 2010 that affected 1,000 Frederick County Public School students. It included the compromise of names, date of birth, and social security numbers. It's unknown whether the data was breached on the county or state level. Um, all county school systems should be taking proactive measures to protect our student data and requesting the same on the state level. I think it would be prudent to conduct an audit of BCPS data to ensure that social security numbers, which are no longer collected, have all been removed from the system. And anecdotally, two years ago, I reviewed three of my kids' school files and found that one of them still contained the social security number. Um, just because we're no longer collecting them does not mean the ones already collected have been removed. Minors are over 50 times more likely to be targeted for identity theft of social security numbers per a study conducted in 2011 by Carnegie Mellon. Parents and the local school system really need to get proactive on this issue. Additionally, state law only authorizes the school system, unless it's been changed since I last looked at it, to store student data for five years after the student has left any state educational institution. A process should be defined and made public for parents to ensure student data older than that is purged from the system. And I'll just ask Chairman Gillis right now that this issue be added as an agenda item for the January 10th meeting so the board can consider directing the system to conduct an audit of student social security numbers and other sensitive information being stored by the school system. 
Uh, I hope everyone has a joyous and peaceful holiday season. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Chairman Gillis. First of all, it's great to be back for my second board meeting, which I've just about survived. So thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. The discussion I've learned more in the discussions these past two meetings than in years observing from the outside. So thank you. I consider myself very blessed to be have such an um, intelligent, caring, passionate group of colleagues. So thank you very much and happy holidays. Two other quick things. I know we're anxious to get home. First, I'd like to um, express that I share Ms. Causey's concerns about not receiving information in advance of our meeting. Um, I'm a data-driven individual. I need data to feel like I'm making an informed decision. And I hope that this year we continue to move forward in um, receiving that data to make the best decisions possible for the quality of learning for our students. Um, Lastly, the decision that I feel good about making tonight is our decision to move forward on the automated vehicle location system. I've had conversations prior to joining the board with Mr. McCray regarding the need for such technology and the need for improvements in our transportation department have never been more apparent than this past week. Many citizens um, within the Northeast have um, reported that their students have not received buses on time. Their, their students have been standing on bus stops in freezing temperatures waiting for buses that have not arrived. And I pray that this decision to move forward and by investing in technology will go a long way towards resolving those issues. And I've also requested that transportation be added as an agenda item. So I hope that as a board we will have the opportunity to, to discuss those concerns in the future. So thank you again. Happy holidays. And I'll join in all the uh, wonderful um, positive comments from around the dais and uh, um, uh, say that there is an awful lot to be thankful for in this school system, a lot to be proud of, and a lot of reasons to march forward in 2017 with a positive vision. So um, I, um, I wish everyone a happy uh, holiday season as well. Uh, there are several items on uh, our agenda. Item L, um, Mr. Yulfelder told us about L3, the MBE SBE annual report. There's also uh, the revised superintendent's rule 1280 and the financial report for the um, month ending October 2015 and 2016. Uh, finally, uh, item M on our uh, agenda is announcements. Our Christmas holiday winter break begins on December 23 and schools reopen on January 3. Our next board meeting uh, is on January 10, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. I'll add there that uh, in 2017 all of our meetings will begin at 6.30 p.m. Uh, schools will close on January 13 at th uh, three hours early. Uh, for grade reporting and data analysis. Schools will also be closed on January 16 for observance of Martin Luther King's birthday. And finally, we have a public hearing scheduled for January 17 at 6.30 right here on the FY18 operating budget. Uh, with that, we're adjourned.